What animal in the wild doesn't eat when there's food available and they're hungry? You have a biological imperative to eat when you're hungry. If you're withholding, you're not quite eating enough. Your body's thinking, well, it's because it doesn't, it's not accessible. We don't have access to it. And so it'll just slow down your metabolism. Less coming in, less is going out. That's all there is to it. You're going to store, hold on to your fat more. So you want to encourage your metabolism. You want your metabolism to go up. So you want to eat fatty meat until it stops tasting good and let your body tell you when that is. All right. Hello, everyone. Thanks everyone for joining. Today's for the live for March 1st for me and then February 29th for, for most everybody else. So thanks everyone for joining. I am just taking a look here. We've already had some, some super chats. Um, and uh, also wanted to mention, I don't know if people saw this on um on uh lane norton's live, but he made some stupid little reel where he took two seconds from from a podcast i saw of a three-hour podcast we go into nuanced detail about all sorts of things and just you know stating the fact that you know uh plants have known carcinogens in them and so you know the brain trust then cuts that out and goes on a whole tirade about, oh, well, dose makes a poison and uh, never points out what the dose is, by the way. So he says that there's poison, but he doesn't say what that dose, but and dose makes a poison, but it doesn't say what that dose is, right? Because he has no idea. And so like, why would you say that? Uh, yes, well, there's a poison, but it doesn't matter because it's too low a dose. Well, how would you know? You don't know what the dose is. You don't even know how much is in there. You don't even know what's in there. You're just saying, yeah, I'm sure it's fine. And I said, oh, well, there's the human data. And the guy is such a spaz, you know, just the human data. It's just like, it's like a six-year-old got a YouTube channel. And um, so he said, talks about the human data. It's like, oh, wait, there is some. And it's like, when I put out the randomized control trials, you know, they always say this, that, and the other. Uh, he didn't provide a single randomized control trial. So he put three uh, links for studies. In, his, in the little description, not a single one was a randomized controlled trial. He flashed a study title um, in the in the uh, video. That wasn't a randomized controlled trial. That was a systematic review of epidemiological trials. Oh, sorry, there there was one randomized controlled trial in that list of fifty studies that they included in this systematic review. And that was a randomized control trial where they took frozen cabbage and used that as ice packs on women's breasts who were breastfeeding and had, had swollen, painful uh, breasts and versus ice packs. So it was a randomized control trial of using frozen cabbage as an ice pack versus normal ice packs. And some of the women said that they preferred the cabbage better than the ice packs, even though they gave the exact same objective uh, reductions in inflammation. Um, wow, Lane. I mean, my goodness, what rigorous studies you put forward. I mean, I am so impressed. I, I, I changed my, I have to change my entire philosophy now off the, the rigor of your, of your studies and logic. So then he goes on saying that, you know, he puts up these randomized control trials and people then, um, you know, shift to say, oh, well, but but some studies are, are flawed. And, um, um, and I'm not saying they're flawed. I'm saying that they're crap. Those are stupid studies. They mean nothing. Um, you're talking about, about people freezing cabbage and putting them on their breasts to reduce inflammation. And you're saying that that's a, a reasonable demonstration of the fact that, that the poisons in plants don't cause harm. That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my entire life. But of course, he, I'm sure he hasn't even read his own study. He just looked at the headlines because he's a hack. And so, and then he says, oh, then they just go to the anecdotes. Look at all these people. So if he knew logic, he would understand that's a logical fallacy called a straw man. Uh, I've never said that. I've never said, oh, but, but some studies are flawed when he pulls out that. I've pointed out that every single study that he puts out is garbage. It's absolute garbage, and it doesn't compare what we're talking about. The ones that did show, you know, cohort studies and different sort of epidemiological studies, I looked at these damn things. I went through 
all of the damn ones in this in the systematic review. There's only one randomized control trial. The rest of them were epidemiological. And all they did was look at the difference between a standard processed food diet and people who ate more uh, fruits and vegetables. So again, completely useless for what we're talking about, right? So it doesn't say anything about the question at hand, which is, are there harmful substances in plants? Objectively, yes, there are. We've quantified them, we've named them, we've shown them in uh, countless textbooks, studies, and so on. Um, and he just says, yeah, well, I'm sure that, I'm sure that they're fine. Um, uh, yes, you know, there could be poisons, but yeah, just eat an unlimited amount. Why would you say that? I mean, there, I mean, there's countless, countless, countless studies showing um, the direct harm and human harm that are caused from eating certain foods. Hey, buddy, eating cer certain plants, getting cyanide poisoning, getting oxalate poisoning, um, you know, different tannins and other sorts of things causing harm. Cyanide is known to damage the mitochondria. It's known to cause thyroid dysfunction and goiters, neurological dysfunction in even small doses, small continual doses uh, ongoing. And this is these are and things like cassava, which are major uh, staples in the tropics of hundreds of millions of people. You know, this actually comes into play and just saying, no, it's perfectly fine. Eat as much as you want is not only irresponsible, it's just ignorant. Um, and um, so it looks like he's not even reading his own studies, which doesn't surprise me. These are just terrible studies anyway. Um, and um, and then he said, "There's oh, I could just keep going about all the different studies. Um, like not not a single one, not a single one compared." Well, the populations that we're talking about, whole food, meat-based diet with a whole food, plant-based diet, not a single one, and not a single one was a randomized controlled trial. You have to dig in to the systematic review that he referenced, and there's one randomized controlled trial, and it's about ice cabbage on your breasts, right? So literally the worst PhD I've ever heard in my life. I I, I think they just have, hand these out now. I mean, it's just like the... Um, you know the the reduction in in uh, quality of of um, the education system now, and uh, just hand out PhDs like Pez dispensers. I get apparently, you know, it's just it's just insane. So one of the studies, I swear to God, I, I get this as an example. Um, oh, and also in that systematic review that he says, oh, this this randomized control trials, you know, because he's a six-year-old spaz. Um, the own the author of the, his own study that he put forward says, and I quote, in the <laughs> and I quote uh, at the at the bottom it says, the quality of the majority, sixty-eight percent of the evidence in this systematic review was low. Right. So this is low quality evidence. The majority of these studies included in his systematic review that he thinks is just the end all be all. This proves it. This proves everything by the own by the author's own admission were low. Nearly 70 percent of the studies used were low quality evidence. I mean, this is just hilarious that he thinks that this this has any meaning in the real world. So I don't know if he's just not smart enough to realize that these were low quality studies, that none of them were RCTs, even though he said they were RCTs, um, or if he just thinks his followers are too stupid to, to look him up. Um, probably both, you know, I mean, he's just like, he's one of those guys that just looks at the headlines and just says, yep, yeah, that, that, that says what I wanted to say. And then like doesn't check anything. It's absolutely it's hilarious. Um, one of the other studies, um, that again, and it's epidemiological, but um, this 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 proves that these plant toxins um, are actually good for you, um, and and at least doesn't don't cause harm. Say, so, oh, these have anti-cancer effects; they have health benefits, and blah 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 blah. So, so one of the studies that he put forward, uh, and I'll just talk about it here. 
it um, it showed it was, it was a study looking at uh, a couple thousand people down in Costa Rica having heart attacks. And they said, okay, are these um, are these toxins in um, in you know the brassica leafy green vegetables, um, the isothiocyanides, are these are these um, beneficial, right? And uh, or vegetables in general beneficial. Now these are known toxins. And why do we know that they're toxins? Because our body reacts to them as a toxin by trying to detoxify them and clear them from the body, right? And there's some people that have genetic differences and they don't clear it as fast or they don't clear it as well. And so they tried to differentiate out between these people that had a heart attack, which they survived um, and looked at to, to, to see that if the people that metabolized them better and got them out of the system uh, did better than the people who didn't clear them as well. So they were around in the body more. And so if they're eating more of these things and they differentiate out to eating like, you know, low and, uh, you know, low through high levels of, uh, there's four categories, lowest, um, second lowest, uh, second highest and highest amount of, of vegetables and things like that, that they were eating. And, um, so they separated those out and of the people that were eating the most vegetables, they said, okay, let's, let's see the genetic differences between these people. And the ones who were eating the most and had these toxins that they weren't able to clear, you know, does that, is that beneficial for heart, heart attacks? Now they found that people who ate more cruciferous vegetables had lower rates of heart attack, um, than the other groups. Right. But again, this is epidemiology. You know, can you what can you say about it? it's just, oh, well, that's the only difference. No, of course, there are a lot of other differences and they actually mark them out. They don't discuss them, but they put them in the results table. Um, so this group that had the most ate the most vegetables, this this lends into healthy user bias because they did other things that were healthy as well. So this group also had the lowest rates of diabetes also had the lowest rates of smoking, had the highest socioeconomic status, had lower co uh, total caloric intake per day, and the lowest sugar consumption per day. There's a lot of differences there. And, um, and I'm sure there were there were a lot more. So, and then they looked at the ones that had the genetic differences, the one who were able to clear the isothiocyanides uh, out better did better, right? So the ones that um, the ones that had these these plant toxins bouncing around their system longer did worse, had more heart attacks, and so they even concluded, well, this could be that this is actually damaging to the heart uh, to have these things bouncing around your system. I mean, dear Lord, Lane, read your own studies. Like it's not hard. Your whole point. Was that the the dose makes the poison? You have no idea what the dose is. You never say it, right? You don't talk about how over 150 milligrams of oxalates a day can be a harmful dose, and that half a cup of cooked spinach has 660 milligrams of oxalates. You don't talk about the fact that real people in the real world have gone to the hospital or died from oxalate poisoning of 3.5 to 4 grams in a single dose. You don't talk about the fact that thousands of people have gone to the hospital eating beans with lectins in them that were undercooked or, 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 or miss, um, you know, weren't, weren't processed properly. You don't talk about any of that because you don't know about that, any of that because you've never looked it up. So why are you talking about something that you don't know and don't understand? You're speaking out of pure ignorance and you do it in such a whiny, aggressive way that people think that you must know what you're talking about because you're, you know, <laughs> you just talk about it in such an exasperated way. It is absolutely mind blowing that anyone listens to you. It's mind blowing that anybody listens to this guy. He's a, he says he's a nutritionist and he eats Captain Crunch and Lucky Charms for breakfast. If you meet a nutritionist or someone who claims to be a nutrition expert and they eat Lucky Charms or any other sugar cereal at any point in their adult life after learning this sort of stuff, for at, and certainly as on a regular basis, turn and run. This is no one that you should ever listen to. Their advice is awful. 
Like it's just, just insane. Um, you know, I mean, you look at study after study after study talking about these different toxins. Um, I'll read some of them to you from the CDC. Potentially any fruit or vegetable containing cyanogenic glycosides, cyanide-containing um, molecules, uh, linamarin and amygdalin, may be contributing to total uh, cyanide content um, in health in health foods such as smoothies. So studies looking at smoothies, normal smoothies that people eat on a daily basis, and you know they have these raw food, raw plant flax seeds, soy, almonds, almond milk, things like that. And these all, or not, sorry, not this uh, soy, but uh, the almond milk. And, um, you know, and these things can cause damage. They can cause harm. Um, and so they said that um, that cyanide from Lena Warren, for instance, has been linked to a variety of health issues such as diabetes, neurological deficits, sensory or memory impairments, and weight gain goiters, uh, thyroid dysfunction um, through damage to the adrenal uh, and uh, weight gain through the damage to the adrenal gland function. Moreover, uh, thiocyanide, um, metabolic byproduct of cyanide, has been tied to goiter growth and hypothyroidism. The presence of cyanide in these drinks, the drinks that people drink, and so, oh, dose makes a poison. Yeah, in the things that we're drinking in that dose lane, Pay attention. In those drinks, um, may not pose an acute threat of poisoning. However, this study suggests that a diet consisting of regular raw flax seeds, whole fresh whole apples, and or unpasteurized almond milk smoothie intake may result in chronic sublethal exposure to total uh, cyanide and lead to those health detriments that were listed. Uh, above. So this is so simple to look up. It's just people are just too lazy to do it. And then they try to conflate the, the human data. This is the human data lane. People go to the hospital. They get sick eating these sorts of things. Your data is not data. I don't give a shit how, how much reduction in swelling in someone's breast they get from frozen cabbage versus an ice pack. That is the least of my concern. The fact that someone paid for that study is mind blowing. And the fact that you would cite that as a randomized control trial that proves that plants are good for you when ingested is shocking. You should have your PhD revoked. I mean, who, who gives out PhDs to people who can't think? This is just absolutely insane. So, I will obviously be responding to that like I just did, but I'll be making a uh, short to just point out the idiocy of this man and the things that he says uh, because it's just tiresome to hear this guy go off about things that he has no clue about and think that he is just, you know, the end all be all. Every time that I do a response, every time that I shut him down in the comments or in messages or in um, or in uh, response videos, he never responds. I wonder why, because he has no response. He just pretends like it doesn't happen. If someone has a response and he just wants to bulldoze over them, he starts swearing at them, cussing at them and, uh, and, and belittling them. He talks all sorts of trash. He talks a real big game. And then you come back and point out all the flaws in his arguments, nothing. So he's lying. He's pretending that you know he's winning all these arguments. He wins none of these things. He just doesn't engage in them because he knows he's going to lose them. And he says, "Oh well, I come with this, and I come with this logic. Then they say this, then they say that. None of those, none of those things have happened. None of those things have happened with me, Lane, uh, because every time I've come back and show the idiocy of the things that you're saying, you're nowhere to be seen. I tag you in the, it too." And you know, I share my story. This guy, this is the same guy who tried to say that humans were not apex predators. And his proof of that, or what he wanted to demonstrate as proof, was that he challenged me to fight a lion, a bear, or a cougar with a spear and said, well, if you're an apex predator, then you should be able to do that. Okay. People do that every day, Lane. 
right now. There's a whole YouTube channel. A guy goes grizzly bear hunting with spears, right? That's a thing, right? And the Maasai, they fight lions with sticks and they win, right? This is happening right now. The fact that you don't know that these simple examples you may not know that guy's YouTube channel, but the Maasai, really? Never heard of them? If you don't know about these things, if you can't think about them for a single second, you'd have no business opening your mouth. Um, and then, of course, we had spears for how many? Tens of thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years. We had stone tools before that, and yet we were taking out woolly mammoths, dire bears, saber-toothed cats, all these sorts of things. Apparently, our ancestors hunted cave lions to extinction and this is reported on the Smithsonian website, and they said it was because they they liked throw rugs, that they had all these skins and all these furs, and they really preferred the furs and the skins of, of the cave lion. Now, that may or may not be. It may be that they were trying to get rid of a, a competing predator in an area that were competing for sources and a danger to them, but uh, and then just used their, their pelts as throw rugs because they had them. But um, but either way, they hunted them to extinction, and yes, with spears lane. So this is a man that doesn't even know how to use a dictionary. And so I just posted that thing about the cave lines. I posted it about, uh, I posted the definition of an apex predator from Cambridge University uh, dictionary. And it said an animal that, you know, eats other animals and isn't often eaten by other animals, don't have regular um, uh, predators and and uh, that they are prey to, right? And in one of the examples, it said, humans are apex predators. However, they sometimes get killed in the wild by other apex predators. I mean, this is, this is a simple definition of term. This man can't even look that up. And then he makes a public post about this thinking he's so great, I respond in kind, and oh, look at that, no, no response. He just pretends to his followers that he always has the last word. That's his persona he tries to drum up. The man is, um, is, is living a fiction in his own mind and, uh, and just trying to propagate this to other people. Um, you can tell by the way he acts that he's probably pretty low self-confidence and, um, and a lot of a lot of past trauma, let's say, that makes him act like a petulant child. Um, you know, so the fact of the matter is, is that this guy doesn't even look up his own studies. He lies. He makes up. He says, oh, I've randomized control trials. Not a single one. Not a single one did he provide. If you look at the references in in the studies he provided, none of which were RCTs, you, you find one, one, the one RCT in the reference section is about ice lettuce. I mean, the academic rigor that this man goes through is just staggering. No wonder, you know, he he thinks so much of himself. But in any case, it's um, it's it's pretty sad to me that this guy is tricking so many people into thinking he has, uh, you know, anywhere more than you know two brain cells between his ears, because it is just shocking how ridiculous ridiculous his claims are he can't even look up a, di a dictionary definition um and and doesn't even check his own studies to see if they're an rct let alone does it compare the populations he's talking about let alone does it actually say anything about plant toxins in the body and how they work and one of them flat out said that those plant toxins in uh the leafy greens actually gave, actually were associated with more heart attacks, right? More heart attacks. And of course, you know, epidemiology, epidemiology is, is flawed in, in a number of respects. And um, yet the man doesn't seem to know that. So this is something that um, it's just, is just wild to me that this guy um, continues to pretend that he's relevant. And, um, uh, unfortunately, some people are buying it, but more people are coming around to the realization that he has absolutely no clue about what he's talking about. 
So in any case, that's uh, that's that's my little update and news for the day. Um, and we'll get to the super chats. We already already got a number of them. Thank you very much, everyone, for for um, submitting those. I think today I've got about two and a half hours. So maybe depending on how many more we get in, uh, we'll cut off the super chats and sort of an hour, hour and a half or so, just to try to make sure we get all the super chats. Unfortunately, I, I, I'm not always able to get to all of them. And I apologize for that. I do try to let people know, please stop putting in super chats so that we can, so that we can get to, uh, get to everything. But unfortunately, sometimes I can't, I can't even do that. Um, also, if you guys could hit the like and share this on your social media to get more people to the live, that's always helpful. And that suggests this to more people. Um, YouTube then puts this out to more people and then we get more people on, we get more questions and we get uh, more importantly, more exposure. And then more people can see my rant on lane, which is, which would be nice. Okay. So first question is from sunshine kiss. Thank you for the super chat carnivore BBB E for seven months, blood pressure, 170 over 110. Tried three days without beef. Um, tried three days without beef BP, uh, down to 120 over 80 does try methylalanine, try methyl amine. Okay. Uh, or omega six to three ratio cause high blood pressure. Um, not that I know of, um, there are different things like a uh, high homocysteine, which can be countered with more B12, more folate, um, that can help. And then just insulin resistance, you know, when you get your, after a given period of time, insulin resistance will come down. So I'm, I'm, so I'm, I'm wondering if they're saying that BP is up to 170 during this time and then just tried three days without beef and then the blood pressure dropped down to 120. Um, well, if that's the case, you know, just see how it affects you. If there's something in there that's, that's affecting your blood pressure negatively like that, you know, you can, you can just keep, keep it out and uh, track it. So if you consistently see that, that just when you don't eat beef, uh, your blood pressure comes down fine. You know, your body's reacting to something. I haven't seen that before. It's usually the opposite, but if, um, that's how your body's reacting, then that's how your body's reacting. Maybe there's something in there, like you say, that, uh, that could be triggering this off and, and grain fed and finished, uh, grain finished beef can have more omega sixes than you want. Um, and quite low omega three sometimes as well. So potentially, but, um, you know, just see how it goes either way. If, if it affects you like that, then, you know, just avoid it. So just run some more experiments, see how you go. It could just be a timing issue and just eventually your, your blood pressure was coming down, but just see, just self experiment, see for yourself, you know, what seems to affect it. And, um, and if it's, if it's, um, uh, the beef that you think is, is causing the problem, then, then just eat other meats. That's fine. One thing that I just remembered about uh, the lane thing uh, before I forget, he said that um, you know, he went off about zealotry and calling us zealots. Um, you know, a zealot is someone who's so fixed in their belief and they're, and they're immune to facts and evidence. The reason I think what I think is because of the facts and evidence. Um, he has not provided any facts or evidence that go counter to any of that, right? And Yet more and more people are coming out with more and more evidence, more and more studies, looking at the Maasai. You know, if you think these, these plants are so good, you look at the Maasai versus Akikuyu in the 1920s and 30s, where the Maasai who only ate meat, blood, and milk were far and away the healthiest cohort in that study. And then the Akikuyu who ate largely plant-based, they were far less healthy, far worse developed. They were shorter. They were, they were much skinnier and had less lean body mass. They were 50% weaker. They had worse dentition. They had worse health. They had worse health outcomes. They had nutritional deficiencies. They had other deficiencies. And just replacing the nutrients 
in a, in a part of that trial where they had prisoners um, that were just sort of, you know, in jail for a period of time with the British, uh, that didn't fix them and get them better. It wasn't until they replaced their normal diet of plants with meat that they started getting better from a health perspective. These were people alive at the same time in the same area and similar genetics because they interbred, right? This is a golden study to look at what happens in the real world when people eat these whole food plant-based diets versus whole food meat-based diets. And the, and the difference was stark and clear. And at every point in, um, in our history and prehistory, when humans switched from hunter-gatherer, hunter-really uh, lifestyle to an agrarian lifestyle, as quoted in a in a in a in a blurb from a Cambridge textbook on paleoanthropology, anytime this happened, anywhere, at any time, regardless of the crop that they went to, the same thing happened. The height and health of the people declined. They shrank by four or five inches on average. Average male brain size went down by 11%. Average female brain size went down by 17%. Evidence of poor wound healing, evidence of infections like tuberculosis, shorter femurs that's associated with obviously shorter stature, but stemming from malnutrition. Um, crooked teeth, fallen dental arches, smaller jaws, all these sorts of things. The exact same disparity is seen between the Maasai and the Akikuyu in that late 1920s study. Then 40 years later, people say, oh, but look, there's, there's heart disease showing up in the Maasai. Like, right, they started in, including grains and plant-based foods during that time. And so then the heart disease came up. You know where it didn't come up? In that long-term study, looking at all the health outcomes of the Maasai and the Akikuyu, they didn't find any. It doesn't mention heart disease anywhere, right? And then in the 1970s, you start seeing it show up. And now there are people in, in of the Maasai that have that have o obesity problems, diabetes problems, heart disease problems, dentition problems. Those are the ones eating a more agrarian-based diet. Those are the ones eating more modern plant-based uh, or plant-influenced diet. Because all of our all of our diets, all of our tradition, our, of our standard diets. Uh, are plant-based right now. The standard American diet is not a meat-filled diet. It's Lucky Charms like Lane is eating, right? It's 75, 80% plant-based, right? So the difference in these in the studies that Lane looks at, looks at the difference between an 80% plant-based diet using processed food predominantly versus an 80% plant-based diet that uses more whole food and less uh, processed food and a lot of other um confounders that that complicate the issue and uh as as part of user, a healthy user bias so again i mean this guy wouldn't know academic rigor if it slapped him in the head so that's what you can look at those are the type of studies you have to look at you have to look at populations that are eating meat whole meat versus populations that are eating whole plants but like Dr. Gardner from from Stanford said, who is a, an out and out vegan activist, you know, he, uh, I, I saw a quote from him. Uh, who knows if it was falsely attributed, but so that he'd been a vegan since the 1980s, and he said not for health reasons. He just likes being a part of the vegan community. So we talk about zealotry. We talk about people like Lane Norton, like Dr. Gardner, who won't shake their beliefs, who won't stop what they're thinking in the face of the evidence. Lane eats Lucky Charms. He thinks that's a good idea. That's that's if not zealotry, it's idiocy. And not being able to shake his ideas and not be able to look at competing information is the definition of zealotry. I've read your studies, Lane. They're crap. I read them every time, trying to see if there's some sort of bright spot, some hope that your brain isn't completely dead. And every time I'm disappointed. And this is no exception. So that's the zealotry. That's him being so locked in his ways. No, I, I learned this in school. Therefore, it has to be true. You're a big boy now, Lane. You need to understand that a lot of things you learned in school were wrong. Um, and a lot of things you're doing now is wrong. Um, but, you know, people like Gardner who said that, no, no, it wouldn't be ethical to, to do that study, 
to take people doing carnivore and people doing a vegan diet and, and see the difference there. Right? He said that wouldn't be ethical because we couldn't possibly do that because, because um, meat does, doesn't have essential nutrients like fiber. Hate to break it to you, doc, but um, fiber is not a nutrient in the first place. So it can't be an essential one. You don't get nutrition from fiber. We don't break it down. We don't absorb it, right? I mean, you get a little bit of short chain fatty acids from the fermentation in your colon that may feed your enterocytes, may, but it's not much, it's not all that, that much. Um, and you get far more from the ketone bodies that you produce yourself. You get far more from butter, which gets its name from its high levels of butyrate, which are these uh, short chain fatty acids that we're speaking of. So they're saying, no, 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 we're not even going to study it because we already know the conclusion. No, you don't. You've never studied it. And in fact, that's why you're not studying it, because you're a zealot and you don't want evidence to go against your zealotry. And the same goes for Lane. The guy doesn't even want to know the answer. He just wants to keep pushing his ideology. He wants to keep pushing his uh, coaching packets and um, and keep being a, a you know, self-aggrandizing uh, influencer, which I think is the most depressing occupation that anyone can get. You know, I do this. I don't, this isn't my job. I have a job. I have patients in clinic. I do surgery. I see patients on, on a weekly basis. Um, you know, I work six days a week. Generally I fit in things like this because I think it's important. Um, but Lane doesn't have a real job. He just, he, it's full-time influencing. It's full-time selling people on his program. So he has to be the authority all the time or else people won't buy his, his terrible, terrible advice. Um, you know, I guess it works for some people, but you know what, like I'd, I'd rather, you know, actually help people than, um, than be a snake oil salesman and try to pretend that I know, I know everything when I clearly don't, you know, that's the thing you know, It's what Thomas Sowell says. It takes a lot of knowledge to understand just how ignorant we are. And I don't think Lane's gotten there yet. He doesn't actually realize how little he knows. And that's the scary part. Um, you know, no one, the most learned person in history ha will never and has never even understood as much as 1% of the totality of human knowledge. It's not possible. And the totality of human knowledge is very stark. I mean, that's very scarce for the amount of things there are to know about. Human knowledge is just infinitesimally small, right? And no one will ever know more than 1% of that, right? So, you have to have some humility and understand that there are things that you don't know and that you won't know. And you need to have an open mind. Um, I had an open mind, which is why I changed my thoughts. This is why I changed my opinions, which is why I changed my views, which is why I do what I do now, because that's where the evidence led. He's not willing to look at the evidence or think about the evidence. He wants to stay in his box because that's what he learned. So that's what it's going to be. And that's where the human data shows no it doesn't actually lane the human data shows that people get sick eating plants people the human data shows that we have suffered as a people as a civilization as a, a species since incorporating more plants and that we're suffering more and more and more by the increased uptake of a species inappropriate diet and this is a guy who again doesn't even know what an apex predator was or is and that we were them and this is this is not this is not working in there properly. So, this is something that um, you know is a problem for him. Maybe he'll come around eventually, but um, you know I I doubt it. So, and also he he goes off about you know telling people like, well, this is if you cut out plants and there's oh well you have IBD uh, IBS and you have uh, FODMAT sensitivities blah 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 blah. Why are you making diagnoses? Why why are you trying to make diagnoses for people that you've never met before? You're not a doctor. Sorry to break that to you, Lane, but you're, you're not a real doctor and you never will be. And you're not licensed to give medical advice and opinions and diagnoses on people's issues. And to give a diagnosis about something that you know nothing about, you're just guessing. You're saying, well, people have problems. They got better. It's because of IBS and FODMAT sensitivities. How the hell would you know? For everyone, every time? You got any your mind? You know, what causes the IBS in the first place, buddy? Right? So what causes IBD? What causes any of these diseases? What causes diabetes? You know, 
since we're reversing these things in clinical trials in humans, not epidemiology, but actual interventional experimental data, we're reversing things like type 2 diabetes with high fat ketogenic diets like a carnivore diet. And then you go back to eating the way you were and the diabetes comes back. That's showing a cause and effect relationship. You remove the cause, the effect goes away. You return the cause, the effect comes back. Pretty straightforward. And so that's the human data. That's what the human data shows is that we can reverse diseases by changing people's diets to a more ancestrally appropriate diet. And then we look at the human data of people like the Akikuyu and the Maasai showing that the Maasai, they were eating more ancestrally appropriate diet, like just a meat diet, blood, milk, animal-based diet. They don't get these diseases in the first place. It's not until they start incorporating plant food that they start getting these diseases, right? Cause and effect, right? That's the relationship that's showing there, right? But Lane doesn't know any of this because he doesn't want to know any of this. It's willful ignorance. You know, it's out there. You know, I mean, he, he took that one little two second clip from something I said, just stating the fact that plants have toxins in them or um, carcinogens, things that have been shown to raise your risk of cancer significantly and didn't listen to the rest of it. So he has no idea. He has no idea what the arguments are. He has no idea what the evidence is. You know, he just likes to cherry pick and talk trash. And that's... um you know, and that's pretty sad, honestly. It's a sad existence, you know, and it's uh, hopefully something that more and more people will uh, see through eventually. So if people find that, that um, you know, that reel on his, uh, his, his story, you know, leave a comment. Let him know what you think. Um, I sort of hesitate to say that just because it just sort of raises his, um, you know, his reach with that um, and makes it, that makes the engagement go up, which just pushes it out there. Um, you know, so sometimes the best thing to do is just ignore these idiots. But, you know, the fact of the matter is, is that, um, you know, he just shouts down, he tries to shout down anybody who uh, shows what idiocy he's dribbling. And, um, you know, so people just have to tell him that he's completely full of it sometimes. And so that's what we did here. Anyway, I digress. Laura Roder, thank you very much for the super chat. Hi, Dr. C, uh, and thank you. 66-year-old lioness. Um, triglycerides are 79. Uh, HDL, 75. LDL, 148. Total, 239. Doc sent script for statins uh, before um, their, <laughs> her appointment on the 6th of March. Help me argue. T3, T4, and and up, TSH down, that's great, is my thyroid healed. Uh, first time A1C test was 5.8. Doc won't uh, test for insulin. You know, your insulin is going to come down. Your fasting insulin is going to come down. Uh, your HbA1c will come down. And, um, well, I can't say that your thyroid is all the way healed, but it looks like it's healing, which is really good. And, um, well, you know, you can just point out that, that, statins um if you've had a heart attack this is the statin statin company's own data on their own product this is never their the product is never going to look rosier than in their studies they found that in their published data that if you have had a heart attack and you're on statins long term for the rest of your life but at least five years that it will extend life by five days days d-a-y-s days not months, not years, days, and certainly not decades, days. And if you have not had a heart attack, it will not extend life. It doesn't really look like a cause and effect relationship there. If, it, if cholesterol is causing heart disease and we reduce cholesterol, you should reduce heart attacks, heart disease, and death from those uh, maladies. And yet we don't see that, not really to any significant degree anyway. So, um, you know, you can point that out. You can also point out that cholesterol was never the problem. It was a scapegoat. That idea was never put forward by a serious uh, scientist independently. That was put forward originally by the sugar companies as a scapegoat for sugar. 
And so they went and found different professors and researchers that had a bit of clout and no morals and, um, and paid them off to push that, that idea that um, it was actually cholesterol when it was more likely to be sugar and seed oils and the processed foods that were much more prevalent, at, uh, coming to be more, much more prevalent at the time. You can point that out. You should watch uh, further videos uh, like mine called The Truth About Cholesterol and Heart Disease. You could also point out, ask them about familial hypercholesterolemia and why is it that people with familial hypercholesterolemia are more likely to have clotting disorders and people with clotting disorders are more likely to have clots in their arteries or veins and have problems uh, uh, in that of that nature. Um, and that when you separate out the people with familial hypercholesterolemia with what they call elevated LDL, what I call normal, and versus um, those who had, had the elevated LDL and the clotting disorder, that it's only those with the clotting disorder that have increased rates of uh, cardiovascular disease. And the ones that just had the high LDL don't have an increased rate of heart disease. It's the same as the general population. And then point out that hopefully you took genetics, depending on the country. Many countries don't require you to take uh, undergraduate uh, classes. But if he did it in America, hopefully he actually took genetics and learned about population genetics and understood that the percentage of alleles in the population does not change as a percentage of that population with the growth or the reduction of that population, unless there's a mass extinction event or a mass migration event that could change that. So the same percentage of people that had familial hypercholesterolemia now had it in the 1800s when there wasn't a single case of death from myocardial infarction reported in the literature, certainly not in America. For the entire century of the 1800s, there was one obscure reference uh, at a, of a case report in the late 1700s where they said, oh, look, there's looks like there's this thrombus in the coronary vessel. Isn't that weird? Hmm, we've never seen that before. They do thousands and thousands and thousands of dissections and autopsies over the course of their career. Most doctors were primarily anatomists and they just did dissection after dissection after dissection after dissection. It was a very common thing. No one saw this stuff. No one saw these, these throm uh, this thrombus and these, these um, clots and things like that on autopsy or, or whatever. One off. And then 130 years later, the next one shows up in the, in the literature in America, the first recorded death from myocardial infarction proven on autopsy was in 1912. And they said, yeah, we don't really believe that. They didn't believe that this was actually happening for another 10 years or so when more of these started showing up. And then 10 years after that, it's the number one killer in America. So in that period of the 1800s, there's the same percentage of people who had familial hypercholesterolemia. And we didn't even have seed oils back then, these so-called heart healthy polyunsaturated fats. And the only reason, do you know why we think they're heart healthy? You know why we were told they were heart healthy? Because Procter and Gamble, who bought Crisco from the Germans in the early 1900s, paid the American Heart Association, the equivalent of in today's dollars, 20 million US dollars to lie and say that Crisco, the seed oil, it's hydrogenated seed oil was better for your heart and better for your cardiovascular health than animal fats like butter and lard and tallow, right? This was fraud. When we know this, this is, this is, this is recorded in history. This is recorded in the top medical journals in the world that, you know, the sugar companies made this stuff up that Procter and Gamble paid off uh, the AHA and all these other sorts of things. These are facts and these are, these are well-reported facts. So, you know, the, uh, the fact that people like Lane don't know these things, you know, it's just that's that's their own fault. You know, the information's out there. This is willful ignorance. They could look this up. They don't. They choose not to. Um, and so that's the thing. So in the entire 1800s, you have the same amount of people as a percentage of the population with familial hypercholesterolemia, which invariably will give you heart disease and kill you unless you get on statins, which didn't exist back then, and yet not a single reported case of death from heart attack. 
during that entire time. Not a single one. We had whole textbooks of all the different maladies that we were seeing in the 1800s, 1700s, 1600s, 1500s, going back to Galen in uh, the Roman era and Hippocrates before that. No mention of heart disease, heart attacks, and all these sorts of things. You go back further, you get to the Ebers papyrus in ancient Egypt about 4,000 years ago. They knew what angina was. They knew what diabetes was. They knew what the signs were before someone had a heart attack. But they were eating predominantly grains, beer, and pressed seed oils. Sound familiar? Right? So if cholesterol were the cause, we would have had way more heart attacks throughout antiquity and throughout history because we've always we've always made LDL and there've always been a certain percentage of people that have had familial hypercholesterolemia and yet we don't see any of these sources oh well people just didn't see it you can you can argue that to an extent but you know people like Galen were actually very very smart and they were describing certain things you know Ebers papyrus describes these things describes people having heart attack they're like yep that's what that sounds like that's what angina sounds like that's what a heart attack sounds like you don't see that in the literature with Hippocrates. You don't see that with Galen, who wrote profusely. You don't see that with the doctors that came after them. You don't see that a single autopsy being done in the last few hundred years. Of, of any, you know, Dr. Harvey, William Harvey, described the circulatory system. The man did thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of dissections and autopsies. And the man who described the circulatory system and showed that the heart is actually what's pumping blood around the body and not the lungs, he just he just he just wouldn't have noticed. He just oh, he's just too stupid to see that there's a big thrombus and clot in the uh, coronary vessels. Really, if this was so common, if it was so prevalent, why wouldn't he have seen one? Right? This guy described the entire circulatory system. He wouldn't have seen that. You're kidding yourself. So that's a long answer. Short answer is watch the video I did on uh, called uh, The Truth About um, Cholesterol and Heart Disease. And that goes through a lot of the, of the facts and, and data. It's, there's some new stuff there that I talked about uh, that's not in that video, but that video will really cover it, uh, especially with what I just said. So good luck with that. Uh, at the end of the day, it's your body. You know, you don't have to take medications that you don't want to. Your doctor works for you, right? You don't work for him. He's not your boss. He doesn't get to tell you what to do. Uh, it's good to listen to your doctor. It's good to take their advice uh, on board. But if there's something that you feel strongly against and you don't want to do, that is, you are well within your rights to say, look, I appreciate it, but I really don't feel comfortable taking that. Uh, but thank you very much. I'd like to focus on other things. Thank you. Um, and you can even just point out and say, look, all my other markers are getting better. Um, I, I just don't, I don't believe that the evidence is is strong enough for me to try to change my cholesterol levels when everything else is improving and my triglycerides are going down, my HDL is going up and I feel better and my thyroid is getting better and my A1C is getting better and all these other things are getting better. You know, I just don't, I don't see how that follows that everything could be getting better and this is just all of a sudden trying to kill me. That doesn't really make sense. It'd be the one thing that would be getting worse if that is actually getting worse, which I don't think it is. So in any case, good luck with that. Hopefully, hopefully uh, your doctor comes around. And because this whole cholesterol theory of, of heart disease really just has to go. It's just nonsense. Alvin Kin, thank you for the super chat. Is pork only okay? I can only afford pork belly. I ask this because pork is not ruminant meat. I have eczema. I'm wondering if it would work. Well, it'll be better than what you're eating before, but it also depends on what the, the pig is eating. If it's like factory farm, factory raised pigs are given a bunch of feed and corn and soy. You know, some of that's going to get through. It's going to have a much higher level of linoleic acid, the omega sixes that you don't want uh, that can cause inflammation, oxidative stress in your body and could absolutely trigger your eczema. So you can, you can certainly try it. Most people do best with red meat if they have things like eczema or autoimmune issues. But you'll still, you should still do a lot better um, than than you would be eating all the other things that you're eating. So definitely give it a try. Um, but if it's not if it's not as good as you want it to be, just remember that red meat will will probably sort it out. Uh, and good luck with that.
Hey guys, just want to take a second to thank our sponsor, Carnivore Bar. I don't promote many products because honestly, all you need to be healthy is to just eat meat. For those times that you're out hiking, road tripping, or stuck at work and you want a nutritious snack that is just meat, fat, and salt if you want it, the Carnivore Bar is a great option. So I like this product not because it's just pure meat, but also because I want the Carnivore market to thrive as well. And the more we support meat-only products, the more meat-only products there will be available in the mainstream. So if this sounds like something you'd like to get behind, Check it out using my discount code Anthony to get 10% off, which also applies to subscriptions, giving you 25% off total. All right, thanks guys. Bruce Lynch, thank you for the super chat. On carnivore, my cholesterol is 231, LDL is 156, HDL 69. Panicked because heart disease runs in my family. Also, my uh, creatine, probably creatinine, was also high. My wife is a nurse and tells me to go back to eating vegetables. I feel good though. Any advice? Um, yeah, well, it sort of piggybacks onto the the previous one um, from uh, from Laurel there, uh, which is you know cholesterol was never the problem in the first place. Um, so watch that video, the truth about cholesterol and heart disease, and um, and uh, and you'll see and show it to your wife. I mean that that's what the evidence shows. The facts show that um, that LDL is not the culprit here. We've been, we've always made LDL cholesterol. Why is it just killing us now? You know, and the, the idea that, oh, we just didn't notice it is just lazy thinking. You know, we did, we just didn't, we noticed, we didn't notice it in 1911, but we noticed it in 1912 and beyond. Really? Um, no, no, it wasn't there in 1911 or it wasn't there in large enough numbers that we were seeing it on autopsy. And then 20 years later, it's the number one killer in America and it is, has gone up decade after decade after decade after that in prevalence. And as we've reduced cholesterol, we've reduced red meat, we've reduced saturated fat, we've reduced cholesterol, we've taken medications for the same, the rates of heart disease have gone up. You know, you get dishonest actors like Lane and Simon Hill uh, saying that, well, the age-adjusted mortality rate of uh, heart disease peaked in the 60s and 70s and actually started coming down. After that, that's not what we said. That's a red herring. So, you know, this is again another logical fallacy that Lane doesn't know anything about. That you're you're shifting the argument. Or sometimes called people call shifting the goalpost. They start talking about something else. Like, hold on a second. No, we were talking about this. You're 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 changing the argument. The argument was the rate of heart disease is going up, the prevalence of heart disease is going up, the incidence of heart disease is going up, the amount of people as a percentage of population that have cardiovascular disease is going up, the the number of people getting new diagnoses of cardiovascular disease is going up. So just because we're surviving heart attacks, because we're smoking less, have better interventions, better access to health care, doesn't actually mean that the rates are going down the rates should go down if we're if we're doing all those things and those are all positive things for heart disease why are the rates going up it's just that we're surviving them. oh well we're just screening better now no we're not we have the same exact screening someone has symptoms and you get them a stress test we don't we don't just do stress tests on people just for screening you know, it's when people are symptomatic, that's when we screen, that's when we put them on the treadmill and, and do an EKG. Um, and that wouldn't explain first time heart attacks. The number of people having their first heart attack, but surviving is going up. So you can't, you can't fake a heart attack. You get your, and if, on a heart attack, you don't pick up by screening like, oh, well, look at that. We just screened them. And, uh, Looks like they're having a heart attack. Isn't that lucky? No, you come in having a heart attack and they say, wow, this person's having a heart attack, right? And But they survive it because we have better interventions. We can get people through it, have better access to care, better access to hospitals so they can get there quicker, things like that. So it is it is just a fraud. And the sooner we we get rid of this um, terrible idea, the better human humanity will be. Bruce Lynch, uh, question two, how to know if you're consuming too much fat? Uh, if you're consuming too much fat, you'll get diarrhea. That's it, because your body has a spillover mechanism. You cannot absorb fat past a certain point. So why would we think that we're eating too much fat when we're not even satisfying our body's uh, ability to absorb fat? You have bile, 
that's made by your liver. It's an expensive resource. Um, it costs energy. It costs uh, resources like cholesterol, which is good for you. It's in every single cell in your body and uh, your hormones, vitamin D, all these things, your brain is, uh, is, is uh, partly made from cholesterol as well, large part. So your body has a, a specific capacity to absorb fat. And after that, after it runs out of bile, it really can't absorb fat. Your, your gut can absorb a small amount of fat without bile, but it's very small. It's like single digit percentages and the rest goes out. So you have an overflow mechanism. And this is what keeps your stool soft if you're if you're eating enough fat. By enough fat, I mean you, uh, the amount of fat to satisfy your body's demand for fat and absorb all it wants. And then it stops absorbing it because it doesn't want it anymore. And then that goes over. And that little bit of spillover is going to keep your stool soft. So it's... Um, it's, it's surprising to me that people would think that physiologically our body would just make a random amount of bile to absorb a random amount of fat. That doesn't make any sense. Your body doesn't do that for anything else. And um, if it's making a specific amount of something, it's, it's for a reason. Um, you have five organs working in concert just to absorb fat. Your stomach starts breaking uh, down your food. Your liver makes bile. Your gallbladder stores that bile uh, and secretes it into the small intestine when you, when you eat fat. Your pancreas makes enzymes to break down the food further and break down the fat in particular. And then that uh, broken down fat gets emulsified by the bile and your small intestine absorbs it. So you have five organs working together just to absorb fat. And it has a specific quantity that it, that it can take in. That doesn't sound like an accident to me. And so there really is no way to overeat fat physiologically because if you eat more fat than your body has a capacity to absorb, it'll just go out the other end, right? Fine. Uh, so you might get diarrhea. It might be inconvenient, but it's not bad for you, right? Um, if you're taking things like ox bile, sure, you'll absorb more fat than your body wants, potentially, if you're eating a lot of fat, but don't do that, right? Um, you know, th that would be forcing your body to... Um, to absorb more fat than it wants. So let it absorb the fat that it wants and you'll be fine. There's a nice little super chat from my little El Marie. Thank you very much. I says, your favorite doctor. Well, you're my favorite patient. Not that you've ever been my patient, but you're my favorite little girl anyway. Cup of sunshine. Thank you for the question. Um, hi doc, I was diagnosed with uh, Chordoma in the 1990s, I was told it was benign. Um, in the news yesterday, I read uh, Gary Sinesa's son died from one. Uh, are all are chordomas all malignant? Um, no. Um, the thing is, is that you know you can you can still die from uh, benign, you know, benign tumors. Um, so. You know, there, there are a number of different tumors in the brain and the spine, like things like meningiomas, um, that can, um, you know, uh, that that can that can cause problems. Like, so, so here's the thing: you you have to you have to be clear about your diagnoses, right? Because if you were told you had a chordoma, and you were told it was benign, that's sort of mutually exclusive, right? So, you know, chordomas are malignant but if you were told it was benign then it wasn't a chordoma so you need to find out what your what your diagnosis was because um that's very important um so even if you have a benign tumor if that thing keeps growing and pushing on your brain or your spinal cord or something like that it can still it can still be dangerous and can still even be life-threatening even if it's not cancerous uh, if it is cancerous, it's much more likely to continue to grow. It, it may uh, be more difficult to treat, but um, any growth in that confined space of your skull and spine, spinal column, spinal canal can cause serious problems. So it's, um, it's important to find out what your diagnosis actually was. So if you were diagnosed with a chordoma, then that's not benign right? 
but if it was something that was benign, like a, um, a meningioma, then that's benign. It's not considered malignant. It's not considered cancer, but it still can grow and cause problems. So you need to, you need to check with your doctor. I mean, if this thing, you've had this thing since the nineties and it hasn't, hasn't gone anywhere. Um, probably not malignant. It probably isn't a, it is probably something else, probably like a little meningioma or something like that. That's just calcified and, and, and not moving. So definitely check your, uh, check with your doctor, check with, see if you can find the medical records. See if you can find, um, uh, I don't know if you had surgery. I don't know if you had a uh, biopsy or resection of that um, lesion, whatever it was. So, you know, if you didn't have that, then you don't know what the hell it is because you, you don't, yeah, you have to look at it under a microscope. You can make a guess about what it is, but you can't, you can't actually say definitively unless you, uh, unless you look at it under a microscope. So, so that's the thing. So it's, um, so it's very important to know what your diagnosis actually was and, um, and then see exactly where it is. Does it need treatment? If you're, are you, if you, if you have anything, you should be getting monitored or surveilled, or at least for a certain period of time, get serial MRIs to track this, make sure it's not growing. Even if you had surgery, you, you, know, you check for recurrence, but, um, yeah, that's what I would do. Just, just check with your doctor, see if you can find the actual, uh, notes and, and why this was diagnosed uh, as a chordoma, why it was thought to be benign when chordomas are not benign. Um, and um, and so, yeah, so you just need to find that out. I mean, if this is if this has just been sitting there since the 1990s, then you know there, there probably isn't much concern, but uh, I would definitely double check on that. Um, but, you know, 30 years of no problems is a pretty good sign. So, um, I wouldn't worry too much about that at the moment, but definitely check, uh, check with that and with your doctor. Okay. Good luck with that. Uh, JLP, thank you for the super chat. There's no question attached, but, um, looks like someone here. There we go. So JLP, Hey, Dr. Chafee, uh, been carnivore for 45 days, eating mainly, uh, beef, butter, and eggs. Yet I still accumulate lots of gas in my gut. What should I do? I uh, just give it time. Um, you know, the body can uh, get a turnover in your microbiome and your those 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 bacterial cells will take time to turn over. It's usually pretty quick, but, um, you know, it's not it's not instant anyway. Um, also, you can try different sort of meats, different sort, sort of eggs as well. And if you're reacting to some of those, if your body's just not absorbing these things properly or it's getting down to the the uh, small or large intestine and you know, causing a bit of gas, then, you know, then maybe cut those things out, you know, just, just main, just cut down to just beef and see how you go. Then you add after a couple of weeks, you know, you see how it goes. If that's not changing anything, you know, then, um, then you add these things back in. If that still doesn't change anything, it should be unrelated, something to do with your microbiome. Um, and, uh, that normally just settles down on its own. You could also add in a bit of uh, live culture yogurt with no carbs put a little bit on a bite of meat, chew it up together, swallow it in the same bite and, um, you know, do that for a couple bites for a week or two. And that, that can, uh, help readjust your microbiome. Uh, so I would, I would try that. Uh, but most of the time these things just sort of settle down on their own. Um, or if you're reacting to something, so always test the different things that you're eating, limit, cut it down to just the red meat, and water for a while and, and see if that changes anything. And if it does, you just try adding things back in. All of a sudden you add eggs back in, and problems come back. There you go. Don't eat eggs. Good luck with that. Uh, Cause your daddy 92. Thank you very much for the super chat. Problems absorbing fat, no coffee, no sweeteners, not constipated. Um, tried high fat, high protein. Think diarrhea is root of all my problems. Body not transitioning uh, to ketones yet being carnivore for one year. Um, Tudka. I don't know what that means. T U D C A. Don't know what that means, but, um, okay. So being a carnival for a year, which is great. Um, you're, 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 you're doing, looks like you're doing everything really well. 
So, um, you know, the no coffee sweeteners and everything like that, and you're not constipated. Um, so it, it depends. So there's, there's, there's two sides of this thing. So if you're only eating meat, only drinking water, the, the problem with, with loose stools, diarrhea could be more fat than your body can absorb. And it will just, just come out in more liquid fashion or that you're, um, that you're eating so little fat that you're actually starting to get a bit of um, a bit of constipation, such uh, or sort of a slight um, blockage. And uh, and if that blockage is um, getting bad enough, then then you get what's called overflow diarrhea, where the liquid will sort of pass around um, the outside of that, and um, and uh, you'll get liquid stools. So if that happens, what you'll see is liquid diarrhea for much of the time. And then every now and then you'll get this blocky boulder that comes out and, um, and uh, it's difficult to pass. And so if that's happening, you need a lot more fat. Um, so, okay, so Tudka is the bile acid derivative that occurs naturally in the body, uh, like many compounds in your body. Tudka is made through microbial process. Um, yeah, so I don't, I don't know if that's um, you know, an issue here, but, um, almost always in that situation, if you're eating just meat, just water, it's one of those two things, or your microbiome hasn't just turned over and you can try the, the, the whole, the, um, live culture yogurt. But after a year, I mean, I would really, I would really be doubtful of that. So if you're just getting the loose stools, you can try pulling back the fat. Um, if you're getting loose stools with every now and then a blocky boulder, you need to really increase your fat. So you aim for one to two grams of fat for every one gram of protein. Most people can just eyeball it and just see how their stools are going. But if you're, if you're trying to figure this out and if you say like, wow, okay, I'm under one gram of fat for one gram of protein, you're probably under eating fat, increase it. If you're up at the two grams per fat, um, to one gram of protein side of things, then, okay, well, maybe it's just, just more than your body needs and you just pull it back a bit. So that's what I would do. Okay. Question from Lena. Struggle sleeping on carnivore, um, rosacea and acne, even after two months. When in a deficit, my skin seems a lot calmer. Why is that? Uh, someone said fruits and honey. no. Uh, but it causes me anxiety uh, to clear the sugar. Should I fast? You can. Um, you know, most people do just fine without fasting. But if you feel that um, when you eat less or you do periods of fasting that that improves your symptoms, then that's fine. Um, if you're eating anything else besides meat and water, just cut that out, obviously, um, and just eat what's right for you. So if you're eating a bit less and that makes you feel better, great. <laughs> Um, you know, and see how you go. You just don't want to lose too much weight. Generally, people's bodies will tell them how much to eat and just you eat until fatty meat stops tasting good and you're, and you're fine. So try that, but, uh, and, and do try increasing the fat that can, that can help a lot with, um, these sometimes. Um, but if you find that fasting once or twice a week is, is beneficial, go for it. If you find that eating slightly less then what your body's asking for is beneficial, you know, go for it while your body's healing, you know, just listen to your body. Eventually you should be able to just eat until it stops tasting good. People on medications, um, will, you know, uh, that might be different, but, um, depending on the medication. So just to see what works for your body and do that. That's really all there is to it. So Patty Lipstrew, uh, asks, how can I increase my low iron levels? I'm 10 months into carnivore diet and eat uh, one to 11 halves of fatty red meat a day. So one and one to one and a half um, pounds of fatty meat per day. Um, I eat one pound of chicken livers every couple of weeks. Well, you know, those are, those are, um, you know, the right things to do. Um, you know, if you're eating a, a pound of chicken livers over the course of a couple of weeks, then that's fine. If you're just every couple of weeks, you just cook up a whole bunch of chicken livers and just eat like a whole pound of it. 
you're probably not absorbing as much as, as you'd like. So you want a smaller amount spread out over that period of time. Um, you also need to investigate if that still doesn't help with your iron levels, you need to investigate why you might be losing too much blood because that's the other side of things. Obviously, you know, women who are menstruating, they can lose more blood. And, um, and if that's the case, then, you know, the, there are things that can help with that. Um, the other side of it is checking if any, if there's any sort of small chronic leak or bleed in your GI tract in your guts. And so that can come up with a fecal occult blood, um, test. So if you're eating tons and tons and tons of iron, it can actually show positive as well. Or taking iron supplements that can show up as positive as well. But, you know, I would, I would start with that. You know, you're, you're eating the right things. You eat fatty red meat until it stops tasting good and add in a bit of liver, spread that pound of chicken livers over the course of, of a, uh, uh, you know, of the, of the weeks that you're eating them. Don't just eat them in one big go because you're not going to absorb uh, all of that. If that happens, your body has limited capacity to absorb certain things. And so you overwhelm that, then you're, you're getting a part of that and you're not getting all of that. You can absorb a lot, but you know, just to make sure that your body's getting, um, getting the most out of what you're eating, I would do that just a, a little bit of liver every day. Um, and, uh, and see how you go. There's a lot of heme iron in meat and liver, especially. So, uh, that shouldn't be a problem. Um, and see how you go. And if that doesn't sort it out, then you need to look for reasons you might be losing blood. Right. And, um, and that, there are a couple ideas there, um, that, that I mentioned that you can talk to your doctor about. Tip of the spear. Thank you for the super chat. What causes our art arterial wall damage? Quite a lot of things. Homocysteine can. And um, if you have low B12 and low folate, your homocysteine will go up and that can cause damage to the inside of your of your arteries. So just eating a, a, a red meat diet is going to probably counter that. Some people with MTHFRG mutation may need to add in a bit of liver um, in order to get enough folate uh, and sometimes B12. But, um, you know, that should be it. And so homocysteine should come down. Homocysteine can also irritate the in, in, inside of the arterial walls and cause them to contract, increasing blood pressure. Um, then there's a lot of other things. Nicotine is known to damage the, the artery wall. Um, things that are going to cause inflammation, oxidative stress, things like linoleic acid, uh, the omega-6s that you get in plants, those could cause inflammation. They do cause inflammation. They do cause oxidative stress. They could potentially damage the ar arterial wall and other things of that nature. So you just want to exclude things from your body that, um, that are not supposed to be in your body. And then you should be able to work fairly normally. Um, if you don't get the damage to the artery wall, you're, you're not going to get these buildups in the first place. You know, this is, this is, this starts with damage to the artery wall. Um, and so, uh, that's that's a good idea. Try to avoid those things. So just going on a carnivore diet, just eating an ancestrally appropriate diet, not smoking, not drinking, um, having a lower linoleic acid intake, and that goes for you know grain finished beef and and other sorts of um, you know factory farmed pigs and chicken, and certainly farmed fish is just never eat that stuff. Um, those fish are not healthy. If you've seen videos of those things, they're not. They're not healthy. They're not happy. They are just in trouble, and um, so you know it's not it's not a nice thing to do for them anyway. If we're going to eat them, it's just that's the wrong way to do it, uh, and it's not healthy for us either. Um, so those are some things, but there are many others. There's a lot of things that can damage your your artery walls, and um, much of them you'll be able to eliminate by going on a a more high quality meat based diet. Tip of the spear. Um, thanks for the super chat. What health issues can arise from too many omega sixes? Well, heart disease seems to be strongly correlated with um, with heart disease. Um, then mental health issues, Alzheimer's, things like that can be associated with it. If you look at my recent interview with Dr. Georgia Ede, a psychiatrist from Harvard. She talks about how toxic linoleic acids are specifically for the brain and the brain takes them up. It can't use them as a building block like it does for omega-3s. Um, 
so it gets starts getting broken down for energy and that's your brain's not supposed to break down these big big molecules for energy it, it wants ketones it wants glucose and when omega-6s get in there it causes a lot of oxidative stress and inflammation in your brain from that breakdown process and so that's um that's something that uh it could potentially be damaged as well as your, your brain and your mental health um it also directly damages your mitochondria uh in basically all of your cells that i know of and that's going to cause all sorts of metabolic disruption and harm to your body the, um, that uh, is, is, is going to be quite detrimental. It can also cause insulin resistance, can independently cause your blood sugars to start getting deranged and insulin levels to go up, uh, increasing your demand for insulin uh, to do the same job, even though you're not increasing the amount of carbohydrates you're eating. So omega-6s can do all of that. And what else? Um, what else do I want to say? Uh, yeah, there's there's studies showing that um, depending on your omega-3 to omega-6 ratios, uh, people's in, um, risk of developing a heart disease, cardiovascular disease, uh, can dramatically increase. Dr. Paul Mason has a great lecture on, on omega-3s and omega-6s where he talks about that and he goes through the literature uh, showing that. And so that's, that's something. So, you know, a, a lot of people like, um, well, a lot of people in general, but in particular, People like Dr. Um, Chris Kenobi uh, think that that seed oils, omega sixes, are one of the major drivers, if not the major driver, of the um, degeneration in our health as a species um, over the past century. So, and I don't think he's wrong. I know. I think this is this is probably one of this is one of the main contributing factors. I think all the other things add into it as well, uh, very significantly. Um, but the omega three, omega six is, a, I think, is a major part of that. Uh, but he wrote a whole book called The Ancestral Diet Revolution, and he talks about linoleic acid, omega sixes, and uh, and the problems that they they can cause, and the evidence for this. Okay. So a bit each day. Thank you for the super chat. Will vaping cause an insulin response? Uh, I guess it depends on what's in the vape. Um, if it's like a bunch of sweetness and all that sort of stuff, maybe. I've never heard of that, though. That's an interesting question. I haven't heard of that. Um, if it's, it's a bunch of sugary, sweet garbage and you're getting that sweet taste in your mouth and your body's sort of responding to that, I, I guess it's, it's possible that your body could start preemptively making insulin. But I actually have no idea. So sorry about that. Tip of the spirit. Thanks for the super chat. Can neuroplasticity help with chronic illness? Well, um, neuroplasticity in the sense that can that your brain can recover from damage. Uh, sure, because if you are experiencing chronic disease like Alzheimer's or other forms of you know, dementia or cognitive decline or mental health issues or epilepsy or migraines, these sorts of things um, because of you know, some damage and uh, incorrect stimuli from various foods you're eating or other exposures, then your brain can heal and recover from that and potentially have less symptoms of whatever you had, like psychiatric issues or uh, cognitive issues or epilepsy, et cetera. And we do see people improving their symptoms. How much of that is just stopping the insult and how much of that is stopping the insult and then allowing your brain to heal through neuroplasticity and making new connections, forming new um, synapses um, is uh, it's hard to say, but people do clinically improve uh, for many, many issues. I mean, epilepsy, we've been treating epilepsy with a ketogenic diet for nearly a hundred years. And diabetes, we've been doing the same. So it's um, it's certainly possible to heal a lot. And you look at uh, my interview with Dave Mack, MAC, very interesting. He had a stroke uh, 30 years ago. He's you know 49 at the time of the of our interview. And 30 years ago, he had a he had a stroke, a subarachnoid hemorrhage, and he had weakness on his right arm and leg. Since then, he did Atkins, he did keto at certain points. And, um, and it, but his neurology was stable. It wasn't until he went full carnivore 
that he actually started improving his symptoms and his weakness in his arm and leg um, significantly improved to the point that he wasn't um, limping when he walked. He wasn't unbalanced going up and down stairs. He could now run up and down stairs, which is pretty amazing. So um, the brain is, is pretty amazing. And so even after 30 years, there does seem to be neuroplasticity as long as you just take away the blocks and the anchors on your brain's um, your brain's ability to heal itself and function normally. So in, th in that sense, yes, it can help. Carnivore Joe, thank you for the super chat. Hey, Doc from Joe and Colleen. Um, thank you for the help this week. Appreciate your time. Oh, you're, you're very welcome. Good luck with all of that. Um, hopefully you guys are able to come to a decision that uh, is comfortable for the both of you um, and uh, and possibly get in to see a second opinion and, and, um, and uh, you know, be, be happy with your decision. Whatever it is, you, know, you should be happy with your decision um, and, and feel positive that you're making the right choice and um and then and then go go with it and try to um you know hope that it helps with all your, your issues uh, i think it, it's always it's never a bad idea to get a a second opinion when it's not a, a life-threatening emergency life or limb threatening emergency so that's always fair to do and you know when you're talking about an extensive operation you know that's going to have uh, ramifications uh, long term because of it, always a good idea to get a second opinion to see if, if you need something that extensive or um, or something else that's uh, uh, still appropriate and will still do the job but doesn't need to be quite as dramatic. So just you know that's that's a fair question to ask um, either your doctor or uh, another doctor as a second opinion. So good luck with that. I hope everything goes well. Hexen, thank you for the super chat. What is the best way for someone who recently had their gallbladder removed to start carnivore and then keep going? Um, you just just recognize that when you first get your gallbladder out, your, your liver is going to still make bile. And it's going to just drip out constantly. So in order to absorb fat um, for the, the meat that you're eating, for the fat that you're eating, um, you're going to have to split up your meals throughout the day. So you want to still eat the same amount of fat over the course of the day, but it, it will have to be spread out because your body's just making this as a go. It's not making it and storing it. It's making it as dripping out into your, into your intestines. And so it'll sort of build up and pool up there and sort of be sitting there. And so you need to just sort of eat smaller fatty meals throughout the day. So you can just sort of catch what's there. So every couple hours, maybe just eat, you know, it may be that you can do that with three meals a day. It may be that you have to do more than that. It, uh, it just depends. So just recognize that if you eat, you know, a certain amount of meat and fat and you get the runs, you know, within the hour after that, you know, that was, that was probably more fat than your body could absorb. So just eat a bit less than that and sort of gauge on how much your body can absorb. Um, and, uh, eventually you need to get enough food for the day though. So you do need to eat. You just want to be able to absorb it. Eventually you might form what's called a pseudo gallbladder. Many people do. And this, uh, is an outpouching of the common bile duct, and it just acts just like a, uh, a gallbladder. So, um, so eventually, it may not be all that much of a problem. But if it's if it's straight away, then you probably wouldn't have had time for that to form. And so that's what you need to do. You just need to split up your fatty meals throughout the day. And good luck with that. Future is now. Thank you very much for the super chat. It's very kind of you. Found a YouTuber who stopped severe regular herpes outbreaks with carnivore. Have you seen this in patients and what could be the mechanism? Just improving the immune system? Uh, yes, it would likely be what that is. Um, herpes viruses are uh, many, but they are uh, retroviruses that live in the DNA of your own cells, in your own neurons, in the ganglions, in the spine generally. And so, um, but they can be elsewhere as well. But they, um, every now and then they'll just sort of start your, your, your own cells, like replicate these things, right? There's a whole idea with, you know, the mRNA technology was it goes into your cells and your cells sort of make this stuff. Um, so that's what these viruses do. So that's where we, we've taken that technology from, we're mimicking that, that viral behavior. And so your 
your body will do that. And then once this gets up to a, a certain load, this becomes a sort of a manifest as an infection. It goes down that nerve uh, axon, down, down your nerve, and, and hits on the skin. So you can get this in shingles. You get there's chicken pox, right? Um, and you can get um, you know other forms of herpes as well. It's um, I haven't really heard that. That's great. I would I would think that it's just improving the immune system. Um, when you see people as they age, or they go on immune suppressants, or their immune immune system is suppressed for other reasons, medications and otherwise, um, they they generally have attacks of these of these herpes viruses, these retroviruses. Um, uh, and they get shingles, things like that. So, uh, elderly people in general have weaker immune systems. They think, oh, well, it's just getting older. Now it is getting older, but we're just eating crap and it's breaking down our body faster than it should. So, you know, even elderly people should have a very robust uh, immune system. And so, um, when that is damaged, then then these these shingles outbreaks can come back and they can be very very painful and they can that you know that pain can last a long time so um that is what i would expect your immune system is going to get better it's going to be stronger and um and so you won't get get the outbreaks like uh they did before so that's great to hear okay um so question from Take Shot Action uh, says, is there anything in the works for easily accessible database with rebuttals? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, I have been trying to get a website up and going for the last two years, and I am no good at it. I've had people helping me with that, but they, um, you know, they were just doing it um, uh, out of the, you know, out of kindness. And so, you know, they gotten busy and um, I need to sort of get on that and try to figure out how to sort of set that up. But that would be a good, that would be a good thing to do. I, I did want to have a database of um, certainly people's success stories. Um, and that's another thing. If people, I want to sort of build up that. So if people want to send me um, DMs on Instagram with their sort of success stories, their first and, and uh, before and after sort of things as well, I would, I would really like to uh, put that together the website obviously only if you're comfortable with me using um these things i'm also putting together some presentations talking about this as well i wanted to use some examples so if people are comfortable with me using their pictures and their stories please send me a dm letting me know about that and sending me those before and after pictures and and the things that they were able to help um and um yeah i saw i saw melissa and um and so one of the things we can do is, is, is do that as well. So put in, in, uh, rebuttals and, um, and, uh, you know, the different arguments that people make. I mean, I've made a lot of blog posts, uh, on Instagram, but I mean, they're just so lost, so far lost down there at the beginning of my Instagram channel that no one, no one's seeing this stuff. So, you know, that's what the website's for, you know, I'll be putting these sorts of things in these different sorts of arguments and, um, um, and resources and different links and studies and interesting um, lectures um, that that sort of help paint this picture of what we should be eating. Uh, but yeah, that's a good idea. I don't I don't know of a database currently that has rebuttals, but I will try to remember to if and when I ever get my stupid website going, I'll put in um, I'll try to make that as a as a as a section as well. I'll just write that down. Okay. All right. Okay, let's just see here. Okay, so there's um so there was a uh, super chat from last week from um N Phonics Blinder. Um, that I wanted to get to as well. And they said, if you could study any aspect of carnivore behavior or physiology with unlimited resources and technology, what would be your dream, dream project and what would you hope to uncover? Well, I think that you, what you'd want to do, you'd want to do the most robust 
study available or, or study possible comparing the only things that matter whole food meat based diet and a whole food plant based diet so you get people like dr gardner dr willett simon hill or whoever whoever claims to be the expert on vegan diets and how to do it perfectly and then you have that and you test it against what i would consider the right way to do a carnivore diet in an ancestrally uh, appropriate manner with high fat and nothing else and you compare those two and you look for long-term outcomes and you and you try to do this as a, as a randomized controlled experiment it, it's difficult to do these sorts of things it's hard to control for a lot of things but you can try um it would be also interesting to to do that with um the vegan groups that do supplement and you, you have to supplement right but do you right so they're gonna oh yeah well no your body does all this stuff you don't need to supplement so you have the vegan vegetarian plant-based maybe even just vegetarian or whatever uh, but you, you check those two things like the akiku you like the Maasai, but you do it in a randomized control way and you look for different long-term health outcomes and um and then you can do that with a with a third group, which is the plant-based group that does not supplement and the plant-based group that does supplement, right? Because even the vegan proponents that say this is the best way to eat, they say you still need to take supplements like B12 and many others. Um, and, and a lot of these vegan people are not getting that because you see people saying that, no, no, no. You know, Nagra doesn't say you need to supplement. Simon Hill doesn't say you need to supplement. It's like they do actually. Um, you, you have to supplement at least B12, if not other things as well. And so it's, um, I think that's important to show as well that, you know, if you're supplementing all these things, this, these are your health outcomes. If you're not supplementing, these are your health outcomes. If you're only eating meat and you're not taking supplements, you're not doing anything else, here are your health outcomes. That's what you need. And that's just going to, you know, that's going to just complete this discussion um and uh, or at least at least lead to it because you know we, we just go back and forth all day all oh, the human data the human data human data is crap you know this is this is this is generally bought and paid for by the by the food industries or it's completely useless it's checking you know frozen cabbage versus ice packs I mean, who gives a shit um and um and it's epidemiological in nature so they're looking at patterns and they're saying well these people seem to eat more leafy greens these people less and they seem to have better outcomes but in that that same study ate less sugar ate less calories uh, higher socioeconomic status um, less diabetes right so healthy user bias came into play less likely to smoke right all these things matter um, and so concluding that it was only the vegetables is is foolish right so you have to be able to do an experimental experimental trial um i would also like to do studies with specific health outcomes like autoimmune diseases like heart disease like well diabetes we already have for for uh, ketogenic diets um so that's that's translatable because ketogenic carnivore diets are ketogenic diets um and uh or they should be and um and then you know but but again look for these specific health outcomes people with ms you know get as many people you can with ms and put them on a carnivore diet you know uh we see this anecdotally but we're seeing it in the tens of thousands now that people with with uh autoimmune issues probably hundreds of thousands at this point people with autoimmune issues putting this into remission getting off medications Right. So, you know, you just need to you need to put that into an experimental trial and just really hammer that home. We already have this with Crohn's disease, with elemental diets and removing carbohydrates, removing fiber. This keeps Crohn's into remission, puts Crohn's into remission better than steroids for an elemental diet and keeps people in remission without medication up to 51 months just by removing carbohydrates and fiber. So, you know, we already have experimental data. On a lot of these things not that anybody ever looks for that um and you know if you don't look you're not going to find it uh so i looked and i found it 
So those are the type of experiments that I, I'd like to do. I'd like to look at specific diseases and and their reversibility. So you find 100 people with um, MS, randomize them, put them on different diets, and just say, hey, you keep eating what you're eating, and you guys were going to do a special intervention. That's hard to do. Sometimes when you when you're in the other and when you're in the control group and you see people in the experimental group improving, and they're like, well. I want some of that. You know, it's not a pill that you can give them and double blind it. You know, it's it's harder to do that um, because people are gonna they're gonna eat what they want, and if they think they're gonna get benefit and and reverse their MS, you know, then that's difficult. So the other thing you can do, you can just do an interventional trial. And say, hey, we have all these people. Let's just put you on it and compare it to the um, you know the the standard outcome, which is which is also uh, good to do, but it's not as strong and as convincing as a as a randomized control trial. But at least it's experimental data, and it's not epidemiology. Um, those are the type of things I'd like to do. Um, I would like to get people with atherosclerosis with known atherosclerotic disease onto a carnivore diet and see if it reverses uh, uh, plaque deposition. We've already seen this. Anecdotally, in countless cases, um, Dave Feldman has already shown this in his lean mass hyperresponders cohort that in 4.7 years of average time on a high fat ketogenic diet, high fat meat based ketogenic diet with higher LDL um, up there with familial hypercholesterolemia, which suggests to me that that's the normal range for LDL cholesterol. Um, that's just what your body does physiologically when you let it. Um, that they had no progression in their atherosclerosis. In fact, the trend was to reduce atherosclerotic plaque. So that, those are the things I want to do. I would love to do that. Um, you know, the ones with a, a vegan diet and a, um, a well-designed plant-based diet and a well-designed animal-based diet, that would be very important to do. That would be longer term. The other ones I think you could do in a much shorter period of time because you're just looking for outcomes. And of course, you know, my uh, major, uh, another major one I want to do is with, with cancers and GBMs in particular. There are a number of experimental trials and data in humans, but they're smaller in nature. And so we just need bigger ones. There's one coming out of um, uh, Cedar sinai Medical Center in America, and they're trying to recruit um, over 100 GBM patients to get them on ketogenic metabolic therapy. Um, and, um, so that's something that I'd like to do as well. And, and even do like an RC, there are, there is an RCT with GBMs and ketogenic metabolic therapy, but it's, you know, it's smaller, it's only 20 people. And there's a lot of preclinical, uh, data with, uh, mice as well. That's very promising. So that's something that I'd like to do as well. That's a, that's a big one that I'd like to do. So a very good question. Um, those are my dreams. I don't just have one. I want to do all those. Okay. Dorothea, thank you for the super chat. Hey, what is your reply to the white paper by True Health Initiative to support Ansel Keys? I like to have solid arguments. Uh, happy carnivore here. I haven't read that. Um, they can support Ansel Keys all they want. It doesn't change the fact that he was a paid shill and a con artist and uh, morally bankrupt. Um, you know, people, and, and I've, I've seen people. Uh, defend him, uh, you know, like Zoe Hart. I love Zoe Harkum and I love her videos. And she did a video basically saying, hey, look, Ansel Keys isn't all bad. He actually did a lot of really good work. And that's fine. But he, and of course he had to because he had to have the clout and authority and recognition to uh, to sell, right? If he, I mean, if he wasn't a good researcher and a good scientist at one point in his career, he'd, he'd have no authority to sell to the highest bidder. But the fact is he did sell his, his uh, integrity to the highest bidder. And we don't know when that started. We know that he did it to the sugar companies and and with uh, the cholesterol theory of cancer or of heart disease. But did he do that before that? Was he was he uh, was his integrity compromised before that? Did it was that the only thing he did? Or did he stay pumping out uh, garbage for the highest bidder. We don't know. And that's the problem. You, you can't trust anything that he says. So I'm sure there's things that he did that were good. But there are things that he did that we know were fraudulent. 
So the thing is, is that, you know, everything is poison at that point. You know, it's like in, in, um, in law, you know, it's, it's fruit from the poison vine. Like you just can't trust anything. It says you have someone who comes in and they're a known liar and they have, you know, you cannot trust them. And they've been shown to have you know, perjured themselves multiple times. It's just like, we're not going to listen to this person. They're not a reliable witness. And so that's, uh, that's how I feel about Ansel Keys. Uh, I'm sure he did some good work or else he wouldn't have been able to, to sell his soul. Uh, but he did. And we don't know when that was. We don't know what's compromised. We don't know um, what we can trust and what we can't. So I don't know what they're saying in support of, of Ansel Keys, but we know that he was paid off to corrupt his data, lie, and um, and and manipulate data to make it look uh, like cholesterol was causing a problem, which it never did, and it never was. Um, so, you know, people can defend him all he likes, but I think he's pretty indefensible. Um, you know, we know that he lied. We know that. We have his contracts. We know what he got paid, right? This published data. And um, you can't you can't just undo that. And you can't say, well, he did that, but that's the only thing he did. Well, you know, we didn't even know about that until it came out and was was uncovered. So what else is uncovered that we have? Well, what else is covered up that we don't know about yet? Right. So I, I just think you, you know, you have to just toss out all his life's work because he's he he has done that. He has made it so we cannot trust his life's work. And we just have to to toss him out as a uh, as a clinician and a uh, and a researcher um, as a researcher. He's not a clinician. But um, we have to toss him out as a researcher because, you know, he's he's corrupt and he was corrupt for the majority of his career. So you just can't trust anything he says. And, um, you know, he comes back around. Oh, but I'm doing good work now. It's like it's too late. It's boy cried wolf. Like, we just don't believe you now. You're just you're just a liar and a fraud. And that's what you'll always be. So, yeah, that's the thing. We can't we can't uncover uh what was fraud and what wasn't with with certainty. So you just have to distrust all of it, really. Danny, thank you for the super chat. Just started carnivore three weeks ago. 54-year-old male bodybuilder, 180 pounds, I'm assuming. Um, if it's kilos, that's impressive. Moderate cardio, uh, recreational labs, uh, cholesterol is 364, triglycerides 359, HDL 43. The LDL 79, LDL 242, next mob in six months. Any recommendations? Um, no, just you're, you're doing everything right. You just um, you just eat meat, just drink water, high fat. Uh, no carbs, no sugar, nothing artificial, no plants, no nothing like that. No fungus, no mushrooms, no drinks besides water. Uh, cut down on dairy. Don't drink milk. There's enough carbs in there that you don't want them. Um, it's early days, right? So this you've done it exactly right. You've gotten your um, preliminary bloods that will change. Your HDL will go up, your LDL will go down, uh, or sorry, your LDL will do whatever the hell it wants. Your triglycerides will go down, your HDL will go up. Um, if your LDL goes up, fine. That's associated with longevity. If you don't eat for five days, your LDL will also go up. If you work out, your LDL will also go up. Um, so you're a bodybuilder, something to remember. If you work out, if you have a, a heavy workout session the day before you check your bloods, your cholesterol will be higher. So just remember that. So I always recommend people be very sedate and sedentary leading up to their blood tests for a few days and no exercise, no stress, and no sexual activity the morning of or the day before at least. If you can do it for two days before, that's even better. Um, and then just be calm and relaxed. You know, stress can can make these numbers go off. Um, poor sleep can make these numbers go off. So you want to prioritize sleep, prioritize your stress levels, you know, relax, do things that, that chill you out, and um, and then take your bloods first thing in the morning, fasting from the night before 9 p.m., only water after that, only water in the morning, no coffee, tea, uh, medications, etc. cetera, um, at least two glasses of water in the morning, an hour before you get your blood test. No more than four classes. So same hydration status, same time of day, same fasting status, um, same exercise status, same sexual activity status, same stress levels. That will keep you consistent. 
uh, if you check your your triglycerides and or your your um, cholesterol ten times a day, you'll get ten different numbers, right? Because it just it just changes for a variety of different reasons, and so uh, that's what I would do. So just take it easy, relax, focus on how you feel, focus on your health, um, and uh, your workouts are going to get better. You're going to get leaner. You're going to get stronger. You're going to get more muscular, um, and it's going to be a lot easier than you've ever experienced before. And then in six months, you just check it again. And see how you go. I'm sure it will. I'm sure it will improve um, in the sense that your triglycerides will come down, HDL will go up, as long as you're doing all those things. All of them matter. So the sleep and the stress are also very important. So good luck with that. And cardio is sprinting is better than cardio. Just you know, warm up or something like that. Sure, but I wouldn't do um, prolonged cardio. Uh, that can raise your cortisol as well. Um, which isn't uh, what you want. So you uh, just sprinting more high intensity workouts like lifting weights and um, sprints on the bike, the assault bike, or on a track or a treadmill, things like that. Jessica K, thank you for the super chat. Hi, Dr. Chafee. I have nasal polyps diagnosed with uh, Samter's triad. I am carnivore uh, for a month now, but symptoms... <laughs> Have been worse. Any reason why? Why? No, I don't. I don't know why they would be worse. Um, you know, sometimes we can, you know, get strange sort of symptoms. Our bodies are clearing out different toxins, and um, and uh, and that can manifest as you know weird symptoms. And um, but they generally go away. You know, if you're if you're um, if you're releasing these toxins from your fat tissue, a lot of toxins can be stored in your fat tissue, then uh, eventually you're, you're going to run out and they're gonna, your body's going to work through them and, and get rid of them and um, and you should be okay. The nasal polyps, you know, like you're talking about with the, the Samter's triad, um, that goes along with asthma and inflammation in the nose. But um, quite often... We see people's asthma clear up in, when they go on just a, a meat and water diet. So that's certainly my experience. That's certainly been the experience with many people I've uh, I've spoken to and patients of mine. So I would expect that this would get better. Um, could just be you know just a bit of a of a flare up before things calm down. That would be my that would be my guess. But you know, do make sure that you're you've eliminated out absolutely everything else besides meat and water. And, um, and if you, you still have anything else in there, any sweeteners, any, any, anything, you know, just cut those out and just go with the meat and water. And hopefully that will settle down. Um, hopefully that just, that, that helps with the nasal polyps as well. But if they're really bad, you know, you may need to see an ENT about that, um, and get those removed. But, um, you know, rectal polyps go away, skin tags go away when people do keto carnivore diets. So it's, uh, at least possible that that can help as well. But if it doesn't, you know, there are surgical interventions and I would be surprised if they, you know, would, would get a lot worse with what you're doing or come even come back. So it's likely that, you know, they'll have at least stopped that process and hopefully they go away. Hopefully they just settle down. I'd give it a bit more time. You know, one month is still pretty early days. Get rid of everything else besides meat and water and, um, and just give it a bit more time. And, uh, you know, if you, if you're on medications, stay on those medications until such time as, as you can come off. Sometimes people come off medications a bit early and they get, they get a rebound in their symptoms and they, they feel a bit worse. Well, you know, you, you can't just come off medications right away for, for all things. So just see how your body goes. Okay, so Mrs. Meat Suit, that's a good name. Uh, I have a Chiari malformation. I had decompression surgery a year ago. I know caffeine stimulates uh, CSF. Quitting helped with the head pressure. That's good. Um, how can carnivore affect CSF production? Love your content. So, you know, we don't, we don't really know for sure um, because we don't have experiments on a carnivore diet, but you know, things like ketogenic diets um, can potentially help uh, with these sorts of things. With um, I'm trying to remember, I, I vaguely remember 
seeing a study with ketogenic diets and normal pressure hydrocephalus, but I'm, I'm just blanking at the moment, but there are a lot of things in our body when we make an inappropriate amount of, of CSF that, um, that can be helped by just cutting out different things that are inappropriate for our body or people with too high iron that need to have, um, uh, give blood periodically because their body can't metabolize iron properly. I have patients that have done this and they are normally have to give blood every two months, but now, uh, they go on a carnivore diet five months on, they have lower, uh, iron than they did after they would give blood. And it's, and it's right in that optimal range. So, it could very well be that your body is, is going to normalize your production of CSF, but you know, we don't have any experimental data or anything like that. Uh, specifically on a carnivore diet, I'm, I am just really struggling to remember, uh, if there was one for normal pressure hydrocephalus, it's just tickling the back of my brain. But, um, so yeah. So the thing is, is that, um, you know, you've had a decompression of, of a Chiari, uh, hopefully that takes care of your symptoms anyway, and uh, and you don't and you don't need to worry about it either way. But um, you know, just see how it goes for you. You know, it, this is going to improve your life in a lot of different ways anyway. And so you know, this could very well be another one. This could very well be something that that really helps you. And so it's um, it's uh, you know important just to see how it goes for you. Um, you know, even if there is a study that says, yes, this should help, and then you do it and it doesn't help when it doesn't, it doesn't help. And that's what matters, not what the study says. Um, and if we don't have studies on this, which, um, you know, for, I don't, I don't, I don't know of any, um, for specifically looking at, uh, how much CSF is produced when we're on different diets, um, then, um, you know, it's just important to just, do that self experiment and see how it goes with you. So, I really need to find that that thing on um, NPH because it's just bugging me. And I always I always talk. It comes up, and then I was like, "Oh shit, what is that study?" And then like when I'm I go and look, and then when I'm actually have time to go look for it, it slips my mind. So I have to write a note for myself. Okay. All right. Um, I think that we have got a number of uh, super chats. I don't think we probably need any more. I'm going to go for the next sort of hour or so. Um, and, um, but let's probably stop the, the super chats now because there's already quite a lot and, and I want to try to get through them all. So Jeff Stone, thank you for the super chat. Started uh, testosterone replacement therapy in 2022 with T level of 300 to or 200 to 300 uh, nanograms per deciliter. Symptoms like um, erectile dysfunction and low energy actually got worse. Started keto carnivore this December, down from 200 pounds to 165 pounds. Came off TRT cold turkey. That is awesome. Uh, that is so great to hear, Jeff. Um, you know, it's funny because you know I've seen people on TRT who have, you know, decent levels of testosterone and certainly came up from where they were before, um, then go on a carnivore diet and feel so much better. And then they come off TRT and their, their testosterone, normal testosterone production actually exceeds the level that they had, um, on TRT, which is fantastic. And I see people, um, young men, late teenage, uh, young men, uh, who have come in with very low testosterone, like around a hundred nanograms per deciliter is 19 year old kid should have testosterone squirting out of his ears. Um, and yet, you know, basically, um, hypogonadism, basically a primary testicular failure. So if he went to a normal doctor and they test, Oh my gosh, you just, you're not producing testosterone. You need to go on uh, TRT the rest of your life. Um, Stan Efferding is one of these people and he, he went to college. He just wasn't, you know, lifting, he's lifting weight, trying to get in shape and his, his, um, testosterone level was just flatlined. Right. And they went to the doctor and said, Oh, you need to go on TRT. Well, I have had those patients I, and then, well, and then Stan decided to then, you know, uh, serially abuse, 
uh, the, these uh, steroids and things like that for the rest of his life, uh, which is certainly going to uh, cause health ramifications with the level of abuse that he's done. But the problem is with that, I think he was done a real disservice as a kid because he may not have needed that at all in the first place. Right. Because I've had patients in that exact scenario that normally the doctor would be like, oh, you got to be on testosterone the rest of your life. They wouldn't have tried anything else. And I put this kid on uh, a carnivore diet, which uh, he wasn't even able to really do full full on. He was still having, you know, cheats and he mostly eating meat, but he'd have some rice or snacks or something like that every now and then, but mostly meat. And his testosterone level went from just barely over 100 up to 400 in two months, right? So his 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 testicles hadn't failed. They could make testosterone. It's just they were being held back by the things that he was eating. And so it just made a massive, massive difference. And that's still going up. You know, he's still getting better. And, and he's, he's not all that strict about it, but he's eating predominantly meat and he's mostly eating meat most days. And so that's really great. It's great to see you, um, so you do so well and uh, and do so much better and and uh, just get healthier and come off the the medications. That's exactly what uh, what we want to do. Doctor No, thank you for the super chat. I have severe Crohn's disease, pure carnivore, and can't seem to find meat that reliably works. Even different batches of grass fed beef from the same company will have good or bad results. That's really interesting. Um, You obviously have a, a more a more sensitive case. You know, it could be that medications can still help you sort of get this into remission, and then potentially you can come off those medications and keep it in remission with this. Um, eventually, you know, we have um, you know we have a thing you know things the, the idea of leaky gut, which we actually see on on electron microscopes. We actually know this exists. We see this on imaging. Um, and, um, so these molecules and bacteria can get in the body, uh, and they can cause damage and they can cause an immune response that can then have cross reactivity. So it can take six months to a year for that, those tight junctions to, to heal and to close off those gaps and, um, and, and to heal your leaky gut. So it could be that, you know, you're, you're going to be in that camp and, that you need to, you may need medication longer than other people, but eventually that those um, those gap junctions will heal up and come tight junctions, and you won't have leaky gut anymore. And hopefully, at that point, nothing's going to come in. It is interesting, um, you know. Different, you know, yeah, different grass fed. You know, the thing is, is that things are called grass fed when they sometimes aren't. If if it has yellow fat, pretty good evidence that that's that's grass fed and finished. Uh, beef, right? Because it can be grass fed and live most of its life on grass and then be in a feedlot for the last two months. And that's allowed to be called grass fed. So it's grass fed and finished. And if it has yellow fat, that's a, that's a good sign that this is, that this has really just been eating grass its whole life, or at least in the later part of its life. So I would definitely look for that. Um, you definitely need to stick with just the grass fed and finished. You may need to be on a bit of medication uh, for six months or or more to let your your gut heal, and um, and um, you can even go you can even go with like the the original Salisbury steak is what he invented for this issue, which is you you cut out the gristle, the connective tough connective tissue, and you just eat the soft muscle meat and the soft fat, and then you add butter to that. Uh, but it could be that you can't do butter. You may be uh, reacting to that. You seem to be very sensitive. So probably want to uh, take out the grass-fed butter as well. Should probably never use anything but grass-fed butter. But if you're, you know, any, if you're even using grass-fed butter and that's causing a reaction, you're having reactions, maybe take take that out. Try to use grass-fed tallow instead, or get like grass-fed fat trimmings. See if you can get some of those, and you just fry them up with your meat as well and um, to get that that fat content. But if you cut away the gristle and you just have the soft fat and you just have the soft muscle meat, you'll absorb nearly 100% of that. And you'll find that you don't actually go to the bathroom or need to go to the bathroom uh, very often at all. 
And so uh, there was a lady that um, that was doing this, and she didn't didn't go for a month, but it was soft and small. You know, she didn't have any obstructions or anything like that. So, but you need to make sure you're getting enough fat as well, because if you're not going all that time, then you know you need to make sure everything's soft and not getting stuck. Um, and that that's the reason you're not going as opposed, you know, because there's just not anything there to pass as opposed to, um, you know, it's getting stuck and moving slow. So that's what I would do. I would, um, you know, try to make sure you're getting, you know, yellow fat grass fed beef, cut out the gristle, um, just eat the soft fat, the soft meat, make sure you're getting enough fat. Probably don't use butter for now see how that goes. Hopefully within the next few months, you'll be able to uh, be open things up a bit more. Um, but, you know, there, there's some people that have to do that. I, you know, Salisbury talks about it, and people wrote books after that using the Salisbury method. And, you know, it took over a year sometimes for people to really get to the point that they were, they were uh, back to normal health. And so, you know, it can be, it can be a longer process. But, um, you know, most people, especially with Crohn's, do respond very positively early on. Sounds like you're already doing that. You're getting different results with different batches, but sometimes you're getting good results, which is good. So try to try to maybe also have a food diary, write down the things you're eating, how you're eating and how you're cooking and how you're preparing them and what that's doing to you. Try the Salisbury steak method of just taking out the gristle and, um, yeah, and then and just remember, you may still need a bit of uh, medication, but at the same time, you know, doing what you're doing with like the elemental diet has been shown to be a better treatment for an acute flare of Crohn's than prednisone, right? Steroids. So um, hopefully, this will this will at least massively reduce your symptoms and improve your health, and eventually go away completely when your gap junctions tighten up and uh, close off. So. Good luck with that. Hopefully that gets better and let me know how that goes. Aiken, thank you for the super chat. Some other channels do super chat catch up stream. Don't know what that is. Um, suppose I could do like a. Um, like stream something to like sort of catch up the, the super chats. The problem is I don't I don't um, know how to get back to the super chats as well. Um, and so, yeah, so I do try, I've only, I've only sort of missed out on super chats a few times, but uh, that's why I try to set till to, to stop. But, um, yeah. And sometimes I try to go back and answer the super chats in the, in the, in the comment section as well. But, um, well, we can try to figure out what, what the catch up stream is. Um, you know, because the thing is, I, 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 when I, when I start these streams, people start adding in more super chats. And so going back and doing the ones that I missed will then put me behind for that day too. And then if I have limited time, then that's difficult. So, uh, we'll do the best we can anyway. Um, today, you know, we have, um, you no, know, well, people are still putting in, well, people are still putting in super chats, but, um, we'll see if, we just get through everything today anyway, but um, just just understand that if you guys put in super chats at this point, it, it may be that I have to go, but I'll try to get everything today anyway. Irene Fernandez, thank you for the super chat. Um, can your CAC be lowered with carnivore? Um, yeah, so this, this goes back to something we were talking about before, which is that we're, we're sort of seeing that trend, but we don't necessarily have definitive data showing that. And we certainly see people that do lower their CAC score. The CAC score is not necessarily indicative of your total plaque score though. So it's it's not going to count for soft plaque. So, you know, if, if you have a CAC score of, you know, 108, um, that doesn't tell you anything about how much plaque is there. It just tells you how many, how much hard plaque is there. So there could be very little or a lot of soft plaque, your CAC score is going to be the same. And so if you have a lot of soft plaque, and your CSC source starts going up and up and up and up. It's not necessarily because your soft plaque is going up. For all you know, your soft plaque is receding, but what's there is getting calcified. Statins are known to calcify uh, your your soft plaque, and this is thought. This is said to be of benefit. They say 
Uh, this stabilizes the plaque. It makes it less likely to rupture. Um, whether that's true or not, I don't know. Um, they say a lot of things that I don't that I don't believe. So I, you know, I, I sort of take things with a grain of salt with that when it comes to that. But um, you know, but that and that's a weird thing too, right? Your CAC scores up. Oh my God, you have to be on a statin. The implied result there is that you know the implication there is that um, that a, a statin will lower your CAC score when in fact it does the opposite. It's known to raise your your, your CAC score. And I you know I see people on um, statins long term and they they're checking your CAC score and it just goes up. And then they they oh you have to change your diet you have to do this you have to do all these sorts of things. They go on a carnivore diet and their CAC score is still going up. They're oh it's because of that carnivore diet. It was already going up anyway. You know it's been going up for years and um, you know this isn't any any different. You're on a you're on a drug that is known to raise your CAC score. So there are people that are reporting their CAC scores going down. We don't have experimental data to show that, so we can't really say for sure. But again, you know, the Dave Feldman studies uh, showing a trend to reduce atherosclerotic plaque has already been shown in that cohort with uh, the, the lean mass hyper responders. So it it seems to be my suspicion is that that's the direction that the that the data is going to go in. Um, we've we're already seen preliminary data pointing in that direction. Um, but remember that your CAC score can transiently go up, even though your soft plaque is going down. And so you need to, you need long-term follow-up on these things. It's not just necessarily going to change right away. Um, Daniela Minikanova, um, thank you for the super chat. I'm not seeing a question attached. Um, okay. Maybe there's one down the line. I'm not seeing one sort of here though. So Mart Hart, thank you for the super chat. Uh, thank you uh, for what you do. I've been carnivore for nine weeks and my inflammation persists. Uh, 56 year old male, no weight issues. Any suggestions? Uh, well, you know, yeah, nine weeks. You know, you you should get a lot of reduction in your inflammation. Um, I do wonder what you mean by inflammation. Are you just talking about like pain, or are you talking about a, a score like your ESR, your high sensitivity CRP, and that's maintaining inflammation? You can have inflammation for other things stress, poor sleep, um, chronic cardio raises your cortisol, um, some sort of medications and uh, autoimmune diseases, all these sorts of things can raise your inflammation or other exposures in your household and in your daily life. So make sure you're, you're optimizing those sorts of things as well. Um, if it's pain that you're experiencing, um, the, the idea is, is that you'll reduce inflammation and that that can reduce the amount of pain that you're getting, but it's not necessarily going to eliminate all the pain that you have. Uh, my back pain is a thousand times better than it was before. I still have some, you know, it's still a bit stiff, you know, when I'm doing certain things, you know, that's life. I've had pancake discs since I was uh, 20 before I started carnivore, you know, so I damaged my discs early on from high in, from a lot of high impact sports growing up. And so, you know, that's, uh, that's something that I've, I've got to live with now. And, um, but it's a thousand times better than it was before, but it's, there is still some there, you know, I've damaged my, the cartilage in my knees from years of kickboxing as a teenager, long before I ever went carnivore. Um, and so that persists today. And so, and that hurts and that's sore and that causes inflammation, but you know what? Like I have bone on bone arthritis on my kneecaps, nowhere else. Everything else is perfect but bone on bone on my kneecaps because of the damage that I caused to it from kickboxing, doing Muay Thai, knee strikes and things like that. And, you know, just being a stupid kid and doing the knee strikes into poles and lockers and denting them in and things like that, just, to, just because I could um, and to impress my friends, which is a really stupid reason to do anything uh, like that. But I did. And so I damaged that cartilage. And, um, you know, and I, I had an MRI and, um, you know, showing, showing this and, uh, the radiologist looked at that and was just like that knee right there, I would not be getting out of bed with that knee. <laughs> and, uh, and I, I didn't even notice it. I was playing rugby, I was playing high level rugby. I was doing squats twice a week, like heavy squats twice a week. You know, yeah, it's a bit sore, but it's not that big a deal. Um, and so that's the thing. You, you, if you still have damage, 
if you still have, a, have an injury like arthritis, like something wrong with your back, you're, st you're still going to have pain. It's just that that pain is going to be massively reduced. So hopefully it is. Hopefully that is uh, what's going on and that you're, you're, you're feeling better, but it's just not all the way better. You know, it may be that things can continue to improve, but, um, you know, then the other things are obviously, um, you know, removing out everything except meat and water, um, high linoleic acid in, in factory farms, pork and chicken. So, you know, that's something that to remember that will cause inflammation. There's higher linoleic acid levels in, um, in grain finished beef as well. So you, you try cutting down to more of the red meats, try to get grass fed and finished when you can, that can also help. Being at higher levels of ketosis can also help. Cutting out all artificial ingredients or all artificial sweeteners, monk fruit sugar, stevia, all these sorts of things. They're saying, well, these are the new ones. This is good. No, new is bad. We want things that were 50,000 years old. We want things that were around 50,000 years ago during the last ice age, right? You don't want anything that wasn't that wasn't around back then. So animals were around back then. Uh, sweeteners were not part of our diet at that point, and certainly not these, these monk fruit sugars and stevias. They existed in plants, but we didn't eat those plants as a normal staple of our diet, certainly not during an ice age, right? So just remember that. Cut out all that stuff. Try to get down to red meat if you can. Try to get your omega-3s up and your, and your omega-6s down. And um, you may, may ex try intermittent fasting, you know, eating once a day or maybe taking a day or two off. Try to get your ketone levels up. Ketones directly suppress inflammation as well. And so if you're having a problem with inflammation, you think this is a little persisting uh, issue with inflammation, try that. Get your ketones up, get your glucose down, and, and see if that helps as well. Because, um, uh, because it can. You know, ketones do suppress inflammation independently. And then you're just not eating all these things that cause inflammation and you, you'll be in a pretty good spot, but you'll still have damage to your body potentially that will potentially hurt. So just keep that in mind. Victoria Street Ministry, thank you very much for the super chat. I have a hard time digesting red meat. Thoughts? Also, best tip for overcoming sugar cravings. Um, I'm thinking it. Uh, as I transition from a standard American diet, I need success with this. So yeah, so so first of all, with red meat, um, if you're eating meat or red meat with anything else, it changes the way you digest it, changes the way you does absorb it, say, it changes the way your body processes it. And so that's generally where people find they have a problem. I, I can't tell you how many people um, I've, I've said this to you and they say like, okay, well, I'll try it. And I always say, like, have you ever just eaten red meat just on its own? Nothing else. Um, most of them haven't. Um, and then they try it and they go like, yep, you were right. I had no problem eating meat as long as I was eating it on its own. So that makes a big difference. It makes a big difference how your body processes these things. There's these anti-nutrients in plants that stop your body from breaking down and absorbing meat and, and and normal things. There's protease inhibitors stop you from breaking down protein properly. There are fiber can can um, stop you from absorbing up to 30% of the new, of the food that you're eating. Um, oxalates, tannins, uh, phytates, all these sorts of things will uh, delay or even prevent the absorption of, of certain things. And so when you're eating those together with meat, you're not digesting the meat properly. So it's not you that, that can't digest the meat. It's it's the, the plants that are making it so you can't. So just keep that in mind. Also, if you like other meats and they don't seem to cause a problem, eat those meats. That's fine. But I would bet that if you're just eating red meat just on its own, that that you'll be fine. Um, and uh, But see how you go. If there's other meats that make you feel better, and then eat those. The key is just eating enough. Eat enough meat, eat enough fatty meat. You want fat. Add butter, grass-fed butter to things as long as you tolerate it. And um, and that will actually help with your sugar cravings. When you're satisfied, when you're hungry, when you're satiated, your sugar signals will be lower. Sugar is a drug. And so you know, you're just going to have to sort of power through that a bit. But it, it's actually not that long. It's about a week or two. And if you're eating enough, then, then you shouldn't get as many as many cravings. 
sometimes if you get cravings, carb cravings, sugar cravings, it's because you're hungry. Your hunger signals are very different. It's very easy to under eat on a carnivore diet. So, and especially when people want to lose weight and all these things, well, I'm going to limit it. You're going to get carb cravings. Then you're going to get sugar cravings then because your brain is screaming at you to eat something. And so what you want to do is you want to eat enough. You want to encourage your metabolism. You want to encourage your body to say, hey, we're not in a famine. You don't need to starve. We got everything we need. And then your body will settle down. And so you eat fatty meat until it stops tasting good. You do that every day, at least once a day. And you see how you go. You eat the meat that tastes good to you, that fills you up, makes you feel the best, and that you can afford and have access to. Okay. If that's red meat, then great. If that's something else, that's fine too. So just see how you go and just, and if you get sugar cravings, ask yourself, am I hungry? Try eating. Eat some meat. If it tastes good, you're hungry. Keep eating until it stops tasting good. And remember, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Two weeks, you you really won't miss it. Um, we also have to remember that we have to we have to deal with addictions like drug addictions. You know, when when we go to like comfort eating and we have stress or something, we we turn to food sometimes. We turn to alcohol. We turn to cigarettes. We turn to drugs. They're all drugs. We turn to other drugs, and um, and so the thing is, is that you need to develop other other um, avenues of, of de-stressing yourself. So you get stressed out, you get upset, and you turn to food or you turn to smoking. Well, you need to turn to something else. You need to develop other hobbies. You need to say like, okay, well, I'm going to go go for a walk when this happens. That makes me feel better. I like that. I enjoy that. Okay, I'm going to do that. Or spending time with certain people or, you know, just watching a TV show or, you know, playing some sort of board game or something that entertains you, something that interests you, going to the gym, you know, that's a, that's a great de-stressor. You just go to the gym and you sweat it out and you just, and you just work hard. It, I mean, you feel just like a different person at the end of that. If you, if you, if you work hard and you just feel wonderful. So those are the sorts of things. So you need to, you need to re- replace that addiction with something else that interests you and occupies you and de-stresses you. And then just remember light at the end of the tunnel. It's just two weeks away. It's not that bad. And if you're getting sugar cravings, you're hungry, eat meat and, um, and enjoy. You, you will get through this. Um, it, um, it will take two weeks from when you stop eating plants and sugar and carbs. So you can wean down and that you will get improvements as you go, but you know, eventually you, you will have to stop. And when you stop, that's when that clock starts, right? So however early or late you want to start that clock is up to you, whatever you think you can do. You know, if you wean down a bit, yes, you you will likely have lower cravings during that time, but either way they go away and, um, you know, eat enough, eat enough fatty meat at the moment, just start eating a lot of fatty meat, make that the the priority of the meal, make that the main part of the meal. And you have sort of other things sort of added in there, but you try to cut out all the sugar, especially and, and reduce everything else down, reduce everything else down and focus on just eating a lot of meat and, um, and you'll be. You'll, you'll fill you up. You won't be as hungry. You won't want to eat all the other stuff. And that's good too. And eventually you have to stop. That's when the clock starts. Two weeks later, you shouldn't have any other carb cravings as long as you're eating enough. So remember to eat enough. And good luck with that. Mona Shabir, thank you for the super chat. What is gliosis and encephalomalacia in the uh, gyrus recti? Uh, second question. Uh, what issues can it cause in the future, say 10, 20 years down the road? Uh, what have you seen with your experience this call? Co- um, what have you seen with your experience that this causes? So gliosis and encephalomalacia, so they're two different things. Um, gliosis is and encephalomalacia can come from um, damage, inflammation to the brain, and you're seeing this area of damage basically. Encephalomalacia would be um sort of an atrophy or again, damage. You can get this from surgery. You can get this from in inflammatory processes. You can get this from uh, other other sorts of mechanisms that can damage the brain. Um, so anytime you damage the brain, obviously, if that's a part of the brain that is is um, is important for a certain certain function, then that can cause, a bit of disruption in that, um, unless it's overt 
and, you know, uh, then it's, it probably will be pretty minimal and, and probably unnoticeable from, from that standpoint, um, but may not. And 10, 20 years down the line, any, well, just any damage to the brain in general is going to um, predispose you for other sorts of issues, uh, such as epilepsy. So any damage to the brain, just damage to the brain is the leading cause of, um, of epilepsy. So, you know, if, it, if you've had damage, then, you know, you could, you could potentially, um, you could potentially get uh, epilepsy, but it, you know, quite often when you have that damage and insult, you know, if you, if you haven't had a seizure, you know, within the first six months, it's unlikely that you'll get one, but there is that potential and, you know, potentially later down the road, if you're unwell for other reasons and your, and your seizure threshold lowers for another reason, then this area could sort of kick that off. So, you know, important to, to just be as healthy as you can, um, doing things like a carnivore diet, doing things like, um, doing things like, um, uh, you know, ketogenic diets in general, can help can help suppress that and and raise your threshold on seizures, and um, you know and um, and that's uh, that's pretty much it. So you know, um, yeah, you know, it, it, it's it's quite a general thing. Gliosis is just sort of a non-specific reactive. Uh, process in the brain that's that's responds to damage. So the thing is, I, I you know we don't know I don't know what caused that damage to your um, to your brain, um, and so you know it's it's hard to say sort of more than that. Um, you know, and the kephalomalacia is just sort of you're just sort of atrophying and losing a bit of that tissue that's generally from uh, damage. Right, and then there can be specific damages to the brain that uh, that cause this. So, you know, I think it's probably more important what caused that damage um, that that can tell you what's going to happen long term. Um, but a lot of the problems that manifest from these sorts of things generally manifest early on. So you have that damage, and that's damaging part of your brain, and so that's you know that's. Um, damage that part of your brain and so you know that that damage will, will heal or not heal depending on on what's going on um on what it's possible to do or how extensive that damage was and then you have sort of these these long-term after effects like the gliosis and the kephalomalacia um you know that that you sort of see on mri but um but that's it so you know and again the long term generally long term is is going to be things like epilepsy that's what you're going to have to contend with. Um, that's pretty much it. I think that's, yeah, I think that's um, hopefully, hopefully enough to answer your question anyway. But, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's hopefully something that will just remain stable and, uh, and not cause you problems at all, especially if you're on a, on an appropriate diet. And hopefully that's the case. Rivos, thank you for, for the super chat. Doctor, does carnivore help with lumbar disc bulge? Um, it depends on how you look at it. I mean, if you you can still get injured, and you can still get a disc bulge. Um, if you already have disc bulges, if there's an inflammatory process and you have a bit of damage, you know it can help your body scar it down or reduce the inflammation and potentially sort of scar that down. It depends on, on how extensive it is. It depends on the cause. Um, but you can still get injured. You know, disc bulges are de are generally traumatic. And so being on carnivore or not, I mean, if you're on carnivore, you're going to have tougher, stronger tissue. And so it's uh, maybe protect you from getting disc bulges in the first place. Once you've had a disc bulge, you know, it's just, I, I think it would just, if anything, it would just speed up healing time. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you won't get, um, you won't, you won't need surgery or something like that. So, you know, if you have a disc bulge, it's not causing too much problem. It's fair enough to try a carnivore diet and see how that helps. Um, it can certainly reduce your symptoms anyway, and reduce the inflammation that's tracking up the nerve. If you're having radiculopathy, you know, pain shooting on your legs, sometimes we'll call that sciatica. 
um, it's um, it's uh, possible that that can reduce that inflammation and um, and improve your symptoms. But um, you know, it, it'll and it'll likely help sort of heal this stuff as long as it has the ability to heal at all. If it's not just permanently scarred down. Um, that's pretty much it, but it's, it's not going to stop these things from happening and it's not going to sort of fix it overnight. It's just going to allow your body to be healthy and to heal from things uh, better than, than uh, it would otherwise. So yeah, good luck with that. Spartan117, thank you very much for the super chat. Hi, I switched to carnivore in January. I have an arrhythmia and I take metoprolol for it. I got heart palpitations often, or I get heart palpitations often. Since switching, switching, I have a lot less. Oh, that's great. Have you ever noticed this with any of your followers? Uh, why is this? Um, no, it, look, it depends on it depends on the arrhythmia. I have seen people with atrial fibrillation uh, reduce that, and sometimes people put on metoprolol for atrial fibrillation. So, you know, potentially, uh, that's something that you could see. Um, but you know, it, it's really early days knowing what we, we, what, what can improve on this sort of thing. Um, and so that's great. So it's just a matter of, of collecting that, that data. And so it'd be interesting to see what kind of, um, what kind of arrhythmia that you had and, um, and why that, that helped. Um, just, just so you guys know, I'm still getting super chats guys. Um, uh, please, please no more super chats. Cause I have, uh, I, uh, I, I, I want to get through all these and, uh, and I need to, I need to go at some point. Um, so I had seen people improve, um, you know, just, uh, certainly for, uh, atrial fibrillation. Um, and also I see contractility and, uh, echoes and things like that. Injection fractions improve as well. Um, that's going to be for a lot of reasons. Your heart's getting healthier, your body's getting healthier, your heart's running on ketones now, which is, is actually your uh, myocardiocyte's preferred energy source. Um, and that's really important for your heart and, and the normal functioning of your heart. So it could be that there's a lot more to this. And um, and we see, and we see um, you know, people improving. We see people improving. Um, uh, with with other sorts of arrhythmias, but you know it, it sort of remains to be seen. But that's really great that that that's improved for you. Uh, hopefully, it just continues continues like that and settles down completely. That'd be fantastic. Cole Brew, thank you for the super chat. Do you know anyone who does BJJ and is on carnivore, and how did it affect them? Yeah, yeah, one of the Gracies does it actually. Um, so uh, Holland Gracie, R H A L E N or A N, yeah, A N. Um, uh, R H A L A N, uh, Gracie's like the, the grandson of the, of the founder of Gracie Jiu Jitsu, you know, Hoist Gracie's nephew. Um, his father was, was a, was a fighter too. I, I can't remember his father's name. I feel like a, uh, like a bastard for not remembering that, but, um, but yeah, in the Gracie family. So he does that and he does full carnivore and he said it's absolute game changer and how he feels and his athleticism and his training, he just feels amazing. So he's head of um, Gracie Jiu Jitsu gym. He's a head trainer there at, uh, in San Francisco. And so, and uh, so I did a, a, an interview with him and, um, and uh, uh, another gentleman that lives down there in San Francisco with him, who's like a American Ninja warrior. He's on uh, Instagram as uh, SF Ninja. And, um, you know, both are great guys and, um, and, uh, they they've just done all sorts of crazy things with carnivore and the, um, you know, even did the, the Ninja warrior, American Ninja warrior challenge, like on carnivore and, um, you know, felt great doing it. So yeah, absolutely. Uh, and there are more and more people doing this as well, but, uh, yeah, that's, that's one who I specifically interviewed. So if you want to check out that interview, um, it's on my YouTube channel and, um, and, uh, you can see for yourself. Yeah. They, they both feel great doing that. So yeah, good question. Mentis Publius. Thank you for the super chat. As I understand, my body will tell me how much salt I need based on the taste. I got a strange headache after salty, delicious ribeye twice a week. Also keto chow drops in my water. Is that too much sodium? Potentially if you're getting headaches from it, then, then, you know, tone it down. Um, 
you know, is there anything else in the keto chow? I don't know. Um, I've never taken it. I don't know if they have different kinds that have different sweeteners or artificial in, uh, uh, flavorings or things like that. If they do, just cut them out. Don't worry. This is natural flavorings. Even even worse. Just get rid of them, and um, uh, you know, see how you go. But you know, if you're if you're adding salt and you're getting a headache, try not having the salt. Headaches uh, are quite often precipitated by dehydration as well. So just make sure you're getting enough water also. Um, you know, the more salt you add, the more water you're going to need. And so just, just remember that also. So just play around with it. Uh, it may be unrelated. You can get a food diary and just a food and symptom diary, writing down exactly what you eat, how much salt you use, how much water you're drinking that day. And then when you're getting these symptoms and see if there's a connection in a pattern, uh, quite often there is. And, um, but if there's not, then you at least have that piece of information as well. That's like, mm, it doesn't seem to be related to the things that I'm eating. So, you know, we'll go with that too. So, uh, yeah, just, uh, do some of that, keep track and, uh, track your progress and see how you go. Michelle Zay, thank you for the super chat. Hi, Dr. C. Is there anything I can print off and take to my doc showing that cholesterol is not the cause of heart disease, please? Um, yeah, if, uh, if you go to my, um, if you go to my video on the truth about cholesterol and heart disease, I have a lot of studies and links in the description that you can that you can uh, print out those studies. Um, and uh, and there's other ones in there. I haven't put all the the links for all the studies I talk about. Sometimes I sort of refer to them by name, and I just haven't gone gone back and put them all in. Um, but you can sort of look those up those other ones up if they don't don't have links in the description, and you can sort of take in the ones that you feel are are strongest. You can also um, take in the um, Dave Feldman, Nick Norwitz, uh, lean mass hyper responder study that just got published, uh, showing that people on a high fat ketogenic diet with markedly elevated uh, LDL, according to them, according to normal standards, um, uh, on average on this diet with elevated LDL for 4.7 years, did not progress atherosclerosis and in fact trended downwards. And one of the top lipidologists who was working on this, who still believes and says in the paper, oh, look, I still believe that LDL directly causes um, the development of atherosclerotic plaque. However, in this population of the keto carnivore population, it appears that it doesn't. And, and he said that this is definitely long enough to see if there was going to be something to see. And they're going to keep tracking that as well. But those are the things as well. And, um, and just the fraud, you know, the sugar companies made up this, this whole, um, this whole idea in the first place and then paid people to per uh, perpetuate it. It's a fraud. And we, that's published in the journal, of the American medical association, 2016 in JAMA. So, you know, their own internal memos and documents. It's not, this is not someone just accusing them of this. This is them saying they did it and what they did, how much they paid them to do it. So, that's the thing. This is all a fraud, and um, and the evidence is there. Michael Robert, thank you for the super chat. Doc, do you think weightlifting and running is natural and beneficial for prolonging lifespan, or is it better to do light exercise and not stress the body? Um, you know, I think I think your, your body's meant to run, meant to sprint in particular when we're running after prey or running away from a tiger or something like that. You're not going to get too far from a tiger. You're better better off staying and fighting, but, um, uh, although that's not going to go too well either. Um, but, um, you know, unless you have a, a spear like, uh, Lane Norton, but, um, you know, but, uh, the thing is, is that we do have studies looking at weightlifting, sprinting, things like that. And they can actually, in, at least in some studies, lengthen telomeres, and so telomeres are the, the cap on the end of your chromosomes that basically tell you how long that cell line is going to live and how long you're going to live. And so if that starts shrinking down, shrinking down, shrinking down, shrinking down, you're coming, you're coming towards the end. Um, but then you start doing things that sort of build that up. And there are some things like, like this sort of exercise, like growth hormone can uh, lengthen your telomeres and lifting weights and sprinting can raise your growth hormone can and raise your telomeres either independently or via the growth hormone uh, increase. And um, so I think it would be beneficial. You know, we're, we're supposed to use our bodies. We're supposed to be um, strong 
vibrant individuals that are going around doing things in the wild. And that's what we've always done, chopping down trees and building houses and forts and, and um, or, you know, just living out in the wild and, you know, um, fighting off, you know, giant saber toothed cats and, um, you know, attacking and taking out woolly mammoths and mastodons and things like that. And then chopping them up and lugging hundreds of pounds of meat, however many miles back to camp and back to back to where you guys live. So this isn't um, this isn't something that we're not designed for. We're not used to. So, you know, hard labor is, uh, is, is part of our makeup. And so I don't, I don't, I certainly don't think it's going to, I, I don't think it's going to like worsen you as long as you're not injuring yourself. Um, you know, the idea that we just need to be sit in the box and just atrophy is, is wrong. You know, uh, sarcopenia, lower uh, skeletal muscle mass is, is directly correlated with uh, in, in, in uh, being fragile, infirmity, uh, cognitive decline and shortened lifespan, uh, for many reasons, you know, um, maybe you're just so weak and so frail and so fragile that you're just going to break your hip and, and, um, and hurt yourself that way. 50% of people that of elderly people that break their hip die within the first year. Um, quite often it's because they're so weak and frail that they break their hip in the first place. But if that's a high, a high mortality rate, very high. So, you know, if you're lifting weights, if you're doing, you know, sprinting and things like that, and you're and you're keeping up a good lean body mass, you're going to be healthier, and you're and you'll likely live longer. Yes. Chad Severson, thank you for the super chat. Losing weight very slowly, 275 pound male eating two pounds of meat, red meat daily, and black coffee. Very sedentary with 40 percent body fat expectations. Well, you know, you just just. I wouldn't worry too much about your weight loss. Focus on your health. Just focus on eating properly. Eating two pounds of meat. Is that enough? Is that enough fat? Are you getting more than your body wants? Are you getting an, as much as your body wants? If you're eating fatty meat until it stops tasting good, that should be fine. If you're stopping before that, you say, well, I, I feel like I could stop and I want to lose weight. You can actually do the opposite of what you want because you can slow down your metabolism. And uh, you know, one of the things that, that Ansel Keys did uh, before he sold out, hopefully before he sold out. And this is what people talk about. Like, well, he's done these other studies. I don't know who the, uh, what he, who he could have sold himself to on this one, but, um, either way he did a study in the, in world war II with conscientious objectors, uh, who didn't want to go and fight in the war. And they said, okay, well, you're going to get drafted unless you volunteer for this experiment, volunteer for this experiment where we just starve you and see what that's like and see what it does to the body and see how safe it is to refeed people after a period of starvation. And, um, and so they, they did that and they found that, yeah, people lost weight, but it, it sort of plateaued off and stabilized, even though they were eating the same small amount that they were eating before. And so they also found that if it was just calories in calories out, that these people, some of them would have lost more weight than they started with in the first place. So your metabolism slowing down, your body saying, you're not eating. We're telling you to eat. You're not doing it. It must be because there's no food available. What animal in the wild doesn't eat when there's food available and they're hungry, right? They'll eat. You know, you have you have a, a, a an imperative, a biological imperative to eat when you're hungry. And so, if you're if you're withholding, you're not quite eating enough. Your body's thinking, well, it's because it doesn't. It's, it's not accessible. We don't have access to it. And so. Uh, it'll just slow down your metabolism. Less coming in, less is going out. That's all there is to it. And so you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna store hold on to your fat more. So you want to encourage your metabolism. You want your metabolism to go up. And so you want to eat more, um, uh, or you want to eat enough, I should say. So you want to eat fatty meat until it stops tasting good, and let your body tell you when that is. At first, it's gonna taste amazing if you're hungry. You're gonna get to a bite which just tastes bland and uninteresting. You're not really gonna want to finish it. So just stop right there. You can overeat on a carnivore diet, but it's very difficult because your, your body will be re re repulsed by this and saying like, don't eat this. You won't enjoy it. And so that's what you do. So um, some people take longer with fat loss, which is one of the things. Um, some people have very high leptin levels, which are a satiety hormone. When people have high, when they have leptin resistance, it, it's going to take longer for you to lose weight. If people have leptin over 100, um, so I've heard some bariatric surgeons say that you cannot lose weight 
unless you get surgery, which is not true. You just have to be really dialed in to your diet and just do a strict carnivore diet and at least cut out all carbohydrates because insulin blocks leptin and causes leptin resistance. Fructose independently blocks leptin and causes leptin resistance. Lectins, which are these this class of defense, defense chemicals in plants, can bind to insulin receptors five times more tightly than insulin, cause an insulin reaction, and can bind to leptin as well um, and block it off and cause leptin resistance. So sometimes people need to just get their, their uh, levels under control before they're going to start losing weight. So just focus on your health, focus on getting healthy, focus on healing your body, focus on just how you're doing. Don't worry about the scale. Um, it'll happen. But that's not the important thing. The important thing is your health and that you're eating properly. Eat enough. Enjoy your life. Start doing things. Start going out for walks. Start enjoying your life more. And, um, you know, good things will happen, but it can take time. So just be patient. Empty Vines, thank you so much for the super chat. Um, hey, how would you add fat if you can only get uh, 85, 15 grass-fed beef? Um, just add ghee, question mark. Also, I had uh, both solid and watery stools today on pure carnivore. Is that type? Of, is that the type of stool if too much fat? Um, well, if you had a lot of, uh, like a lot more fat than you could eat just today, you know, it could be that, that, that came out quick and sort of flushed out the solid stools. If that solid stool was really hard and dry and rocky, could be that that's that overflow diarrhea that I was talking about, which is not enough. And if you're only eating 85, 15, it's probably on that side of the equation. Um, so yeah, grass fed ghee, grass fed ghee, ghee is fine. Grass fed butter is usually fine for most people. Um, grass fed tallow is great too, but ghee is probably, probably better. You can also try to ask your butcher to try to get the fat trimmings. And if he's a grass fed butcher, then try to do just, just, um, the grass fed, uh, yeah, try to get the grass fed fat trimmings and you sort of fry them up in a pan and, and eat those along with your meat as well. And that's a, that's a great way to do it too. Okay. So from question from Darvit, I ordered eight ounce bags of magnesium and potassium chloride and use Redmond's real salt uh, in a mine uh, from Amazon. Um, measured out into a quart glass mason jar. It was quite full. Uh, I'm not sure what that's referring to. Uh, maybe that's referring to another question earlier that I didn't see, but um, okay. Sounds good. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know if that saying that just adding that in and make basically making your own electrolytes, which is, uh, which is great. You know, I mean, people can buy sort of different electrolytes. Um, and, but if you just have your own sort of salt that you're using with potassium chloride and magnesium, and you just use the salt and that gets all your electrolytes, you know, that's sort of a good way. And then you sort of salt your, your food with all of those minerals and you sort of get them, you know, not a bad way to do it. Um, you'd probably be fine without that stuff, but early on, some people can, uh, need a bit more. So it just depends on the person and how you do it. And if that makes you feel better then great, keep doing it. Probably won't need to do it forever though. Tristan J. Pinkerton. Thank you very much for the super chat. I've just finished brain energy by Christopher Palmer. Fascinating book suggesting a link between mitochondrial dysfunction, mental health, and food. Um, recommends the keto diet. Are you familiar with him? Yeah, I actually had him on my podcast. Uh, I've, I've read his book too. It's fantastic. Um, he used to do a carnivore diet. He, he was apparently um, active in the, um, the the zero carb groups, which is what carnivore used to be called um, back in the day. And so uh, I think he does mostly keto now, but um, but he used to do carnivore. And so, you know, he's not, he's not um, you know, he certainly doesn't have a problem with that. Carnivore diet is a ketogenic diet. I think his point is just that the ketogenic part of it is 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 the main part of it because being on a ketogenic diet for you know three four months increases the number and activity and and uh, efficacy of your of your mitochondria significantly. So some studies have shown that after three months on a ketogenic diet, you'll have four times the number of mitochondria, and they're four times as effective. So it's a massive, massive, massive boost in your mitochondrial function. Uh, but yes, it's absolutely great. 
Um, if you guys want to see my interview with uh, Professor Palmer, he's a uh, psychiatrist, uh, who, uh, professor at Harvard, and um, and he's doing randomized controlled trials as we speak on um, on this exact thing and reversing uh, schizophrenia, major depression, things like that with um, with ketogenic diets, which is great. So uh, yeah, very interesting guy and, and really interesting conversation uh, that we had. Uh, we had to sort of cut it a bit short because he had another meeting directly at the hour. Um, but uh, yeah, I'd, I'd love to talk to him again about it. It's very interesting. So people can check that out on my YouTube channel with, with Chris Palmer. Shane Templeton, thank you very much for the super chat. With the timeline you present regularly, the 1920s uh, being a major turning point in American health, is there a city's correlation? Acidies correlation um, found. Do ruminant animals not build up a load of pesticides, herbicides, uh, etc. Over time, or is there a pesticides correlation uh, found? Do ruminant animals uh, not build up a load of pesticides, herbicides, etc. Over time, actually, it seems that they they probably detoxify and filter them out. There was a a, a um, an article I read um, some months back that suggested that that cows, for instance, could actually filter out and eliminate glyphosate, which would be great because, you know, pigs, pigs don't really. Um, the thing is, is that your body is going to, going to, you know, th there's this idea of forever chemicals just stay in your body and build up. Um, these aren't them. Our bodies have a capacity to, to filter out and, and eliminate these different toxins. Um, and, um, and other animals do too. So, you know, they'll be filtering these things out and it'll be damaging them. It won't be good for them. They'll have some of that in there, but it's not just going to just build up, 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 build up. Um, no, but also, you know, they're, but they're, so they're going to act as a filter. So it will be less. Uh, could it be getting in? Sure. The ruminant animals are generally why people have an easier time eating it is because they are better at filtering these things out and not getting them in. Um, Oh, that guy what was that guy, um, Dan Butner, that compulsive liar. I saw a, a little clip that he did uh, where he said, that, oh, if you want to reduce toxicity, he actually had some some decent points. And then he, of course, landed with, the, oh, yeah, and if you eat meat, you know, uh, one pound of, of grain fed meat has uh, equivalent of 11 pounds of uh plant toxins when people worry about corn or soy and wheat and all the toxins in there. Well, if you eat meat, then you're going to have 11 pounds worth of toxins for every pound of meat. Total bullshit. I mean, he just pulled that straight out of his ass. Um, and, uh, you know, they, these animals detoxify these things and eliminate these things. And also don't get the grain finished kind then, huh? Maybe, maybe think about that. So he's saying, don't eat meat. Because if you feed the meat the wrong thing, maybe it can have some bad stuff in it. It's not going to be 11, 11 times the amount. Uh, but it's, um, you know, eat grass-fed then. You know, he's not talking about it. He's just a propagandist. And you look at his body language in that clip. He's, he becomes very uncomfortable because he knows he's lying. And, um, you know, so we know that cows and animals detoxify the plants that they eat, especially if they are designed to eat that plant. And um, ruminant animals are, are really good at detoxifying things that they're not even supposed to eat. And so um, that's not true. But what is true is that it, it can concentrate the phytonutrients. They say, oh, you need these nutrients. You need these phytonutrients. They're so good for you. Okay. Well, you know, I don't, you know, these things haven't actually been proven to necessarily be essential. But, you know, could they be a benefit? Sure. Guess what? You have more of them in grass-fed meat than you do in the plants themselves. So it filters out the bad things and keeps and maintains and stores and sequesters the beneficial things and the vitamins and the minerals and the nutrients. And that's what, what you want. And so, um, you know, there may be, uh, you know, a, a bit of this stuff that you get, but it's, no, it's not going to just build up, build up, build up, build up, build up. As far as I know, it's, it's actually very good at, at filtering these things out, especially the ruminant animals, which is why, you know, the argument goes that you probably should avoid pigs, chicken, and fish that are being fed in a species inappropriate diet because they're not going to be as good at filtering out the garbage um, as uh, as you'd like. So yeah, very good question. 
Mason Showers, thank you for the super chat. Hi, Dr. Chafee, uh, been carnivore for six months. Um, 400, uh, 400 to 500 levels of triglycerides, three months after and six months. Do I need to fast longer than 12 hours? Um, no, not necessarily. You need to um, make sure you're, you're op optimizing sleep, prioritizing sleep, um, reducing stress. That's something that I've seen people have really stubborn triglycerides level levels is when they're is when they are really stressed out and they're having a really difficult time with school or work or things like that. It's rare, but it happens. Um, I would also not worry too much about it as long as you're just eating fatty meat and just drinking water. Then you know your body's going to do what it's, it's supposed to do. Um, you're, you're putting it as best. You're putting your best best foot forward to allow your 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 body to do what it needs to do, and then you just uh, reduce stress, lift weights, try doing sprints, get sleep, get proper sleep. That's really important, and uh, and that'll come down. And those things will improve, and most most important is that your body will be improving the whole time. So just take it easy. Also. Again, it does matter how you take the test. So you don't need to fast longer than, than 12 hours. If you want to, you could. But, you know, you want to do things consistently. So first thing in the morning, between 8 and 9 a.m., fasting from the night before 9 p.m. So you want the same time, the same fasting level. This gives you more consistent and reliable results. Um, only drinking water after 9 p.m. Only drinking water in the morning. No coffee, tea, anything. Certainly no food. And, um, and then if you, you, you don't exercise the morning of, or the day before, or even the day before that, if you can help it, um, and no sex or stressful activities, you just need to be calm. You need to be relaxed. Stress levels can, can really cause uh, a disruption of your blood, blood results as well. That's not necessarily in keeping of what is, is normal for you. Um, so I just keep all that stuff in mind and just keep getting data points and just focus on how you feel. I wouldn't get too hung up on lab tests. We treat patients. We don't treat lab tests. Um, you know, just, just remember that if you're well and you're feeling good, that's, what's important. Reduce stress, improve sleep, cut out everything except meat and water, make sure you're getting enough fat and, um, yeah. And then just keep getting data points, but you know, I mean, just, you know, don't worry about it. Like just, just check it again in, you know, in six months to a year and see how it's going, you know, and if you've done all those things and reduce stress and improve sleep, it should be should be fine. It should go in the right direction. Karame, thank you very much for the super chat. One month ribeye in water without coffee uh, or artificial sweeteners. Great job. Still serious diarrhea. Uh, my stool turned normal after eating fiber-rich foods. Advice. Yeah, well, the fiber is, is slows things down and, and causes bulk and thickens things up. You know, just like you, you, you put fiber into, you know, uh, they put sawdust into different foods to thicken it up. Um, and so that, that's what it is. You're, you're adding a thickener to your to your stools. So there are some of these cases that are a bit, you know, more, more refractory. Um, ribeye, if it's very trimmed ribeye, could still be not enough fat. You could still need more fat. Um, but let's say that you're, you're eating enough fat and you're not taking things like magnesium or metformin, which can also cause loose stools. Um, and, um, and fiber again, will thicken that up too. Um, and you're, you know, let's assume that you're having more fat than your body needs or can absorb. One thing to remember is that sometimes a rendered fat seems to cause uh, a, a bit of a difficulty for people to absorb. And so it just sort of goes out a bit quicker. And, um, so some people cut off the fat and actually eat it uncooked and then cook the meat separately to that. And um, that will be better for them to absorb. So something to think about as well. Um, and then again, magnesium, metformin, all those sorts of things. Um, it can also be a microbiome issue that you're having this turnover in your microbiome. And that can, um, that can cause a bit of loose stools that normally normalizes on its own. Or it could be that you know, and if you're doing nothing else except ribeyes and water, then, um, you know, it could be that, you know, you just pull back a bit, get a leaner cut, see what's going on. Also, one thing that people do sometimes, they add a bunch of salt to their water. That will give you diarrhea too. So, 
you know, it's, um, it's not the case that you had to add a whole bunch of salt to your water. Um, uh, almost no one does. Some people, some people do, but most people don't. And, um, and if you're getting, if you're getting diarrhea and you're, you're doing that, then certainly don't do that. So just remember that. Um, and, um, you know, if you really think that this is, if this is, uh, a result of, of much more fat than your body can absorb, just reduce the fat. That's all there is to it. And if that sorts it out, that's what it was. And if it sort of gets worse, it could be that you have a bit of a blockage and you're having overflow diarrhea. Um, so keep that in mind. I mean, you know, adding a bit of fiber that would probably add to that obstruction and you'd have a bit of problems with that and you'd have this dry, dry rocky, hard stool. But, um, you know, so uh, if it's you're just sort of not nice and soft, that's probably not that. It probably is that your body's just, for whatever reason, not absorbing the fat. Uh, you know, either it's more fat than your body needs, or it's um, it's just not getting it because it's like rendered fat, and you just need to cook it less, cook the fat less, and uh, not eat as much of the rendered fat. So try those things out, and uh, you should be fine, uh, even without the fiber. Okay, carnivore for future. Thank you for the super chat. Uh, 10 diseases, ADHD, ASD, allergies, et cetera, et cetera. I lived with all my life and it's gone. That's amazing. After switching over to raw meat carnivore. Jesus, a minus 375 pounds, just 60 left to drop. That's amazing. Um, well, that's fantastic. I'm really glad to hear that. I'm looking at the, the picture of the thumbnail here. There's a massive difference massive difference in a way. I'm so happy for you. Um, well, I don't know. People check that out. Carnivore underscore four underscore future. Um, see, you know, if you've got a website or a YouTube channel and, and some videos on that showing that, I mean, that that's going to be great uh, for people to see and it'd be great to, uh, yeah, have you on sometime and, um, uh, you know, talk about that because that's a massive, massive, massive improvement. And really, really good job. That's really impressive. Thank you very much for sharing that. Um, DM me on uh, Instagram or something like that, and uh, and uh, we'll see about setting something up and get you maybe do an episode or something like that if that's something you want to do. All right. Thanks for that. What is? Thank you for the question mark. Or sorry, thank you for the question mark. Thank you for the super chat. I recently did a stool test and calprotectin sits at ninety two borderline. Uh, range between um, normal and elevated. Does this mean IBD? And if so, will carnivore help me? Thank you for all you do. Um, well, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not an expert in the stool test, but um, the the issue with IBD or IBS is the same. You know, you're eating things that your body's reacting to negatively, and especially for IBD, you're eating things your body's reacting to in an immune response and making antibodies that are attacking your body and attacking your intestines. So the thing to do there is eliminate the cause, eliminate the thing that you're eating that's triggering that response. And yes, a carnivore diet will help you in that. And um, generally, red meat and water is the best. High fat, remember. So high fat, red meat and water, uh, that can definitely help you. I have a... I have a, a um, uh, you really cut out everything else. You, you know, people with autoimmune issues uh, like IBD really need to be pure, pure, pure red meat and water, high fat, and cut out everything else, all the sweeteners, all the or, you know, natural flavorings, everything. Just, just meat, just water, nothing else. High fat. And... Um, and so if you, um, if you do that, that can, that can really help. Um, I do a video, um, it's called like, you know, what they don't want you to know about autoimmune diseases. And, um, and I go into, I go into some of the literature specifically on IBD and, um, and so hopefully I can help, but yes, IBD responds very well. All autoimmune, I've never seen an autoimmune issue not respond extremely well to, uh, just a pure red meat and water diet. So, um, if that's what's going on, that should help. Good luck with that. Michael Robert, thank you for the super chat. 
Do you think having your appendix removed negatively affects your digestion capabilities? Thanks. Um, no, probably not. I mean, there may be some sort of, you know, people, people speculate over, you know, the function that, it, that remains to the appendix, which you know, probably is something, but um, it's certainly not a digestive capacity like it once was. It used to be four foot long cecum that was blind and you know, had a, you know, just a pouch a blind pouch and uh, and that's where fiber would pack into and ferment into saturated fat and and uh, bacteria would die off and get absorbed as protein so you know we don't do that anymore we haven't done that in millions of years um and uh it's because we haven't needed to in millions of years and so that that organ is shriveled up and is now vestigial <laughs> at least in that regard so no, I don't think it. I don't think it contributes to your digestion in any any significant way. So if you've had that removed, I, I don't think that's going to harm you from a digestive uh, capacity. You know, maybe there's something else that it does, but maybe not. You know, some people, or some people say they're they're like, well, it's probably there to like reseed your your bacteria after you take antibiotics. Like, um, you know, we've had appendixes uh, long before antibiotics existed right so and and, and if antibiotics is going to damage the the microbes in your gut the appendix is part of your gut and so you're getting systemic antibiotic effect that's gonna that can that's gonna get the um the appendix just like it's going to get other parts of your of your colon as well so um you know maybe some diarrheal diseases you know you're getting some some viral infections from norovirus and you're having diarrhea and that's flushing out a lot of bacteria you know maybe that maybe that's something that can help reseed who knows um but either way it's 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 it shouldn't negatively affect your digestion anyway stink ass cat thank you for the super chat uh you rock doc uh change is happening i run into other carnivores all the time uh at the meat counter my grocery store that's awesome that's really good to hear that more people are getting this It, it works you know, and all you have to do is test it yourself. And um, if you want to wait for the the larger studies to come out, that's that's perfectly fine. That's very reasonable. But you know, I'm more than convinced by the evidence, the biological evidence, the evolutionary evidence, the fossil record, the biochemical, physiological, anatomical, um, and human data. Uh, when we make these interventions, like ketogenic diets, like elimination diets for autoimmune diseases like Crohn's, etc., and this is not a new idea. You know, Salisbury came came up with this in the 1800s. Um, uh, Stefanson came up with this in the early 1900s. Um, Dr. Volkland uh, wrote a book about this in the in the seven, 1970s. Right? This is not a new concept. This is an old concept that that keeps trying to be buried by multi-trillion dollar special interests. Uh, so, but the truth will out and this is working and it works for people and that's what matters. You try something and it says, well, for whatever reason, it helped me, so I'm gonna keep going with this. And that's really, it doesn't does not matter after that. If it helps you, it helps you and that's what's important. Dom, the founder, thank you for the super chat. What can we do about insomnia on the carnivore diet? Never had a problem sleeping before. Also, where do I get the fat from? So you want to get the fat from largely from the meat itself. You want to get the, the actual fat tissue. Um, and and barring that, if you're not getting enough, add grass-fed butter. Most people do fine with butter. Um, sometimes insomnia can be for a lot of reasons. So a lot of people improve their insomnia on carnivore. I certainly did. Um, my God, my sleep improved so much on that. Um then I did other things like adding a sleep mask, you know, just a blackout mask, um, trying to optimize my sleep routine, trying to go to bed at a normal time. That rarely happens. But um, turning the lights off, putting on blue block, blue light blocking glasses to help settle me down and stop all that stimulus in my eyes to like wake me up until my brain is high noon. And um, and then, you know, you could also try taking, um, you know, small dose of melatonin every now and then if that helps you sleep. That can help reset your circadian rhythm and your body clock and reset you at a certain time. So you're trying to try to take this at the same time every night. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be, but, um, that, that helps. That's better to try to set your circadian rhythm. So your body gets used to this is when we go to sleep, take it at nine o'clock because you want to be asleep at 10 o'clock and you turn off the lights, dim them at least 
put on the blue blocking glasses, things like that. Um, that can help. Um, and then the, the sleep mask, that's what really helps too. And then you just get into a pattern and a rhythm that, you know, that, that's a good thing about the mask as well. You, you sort of put that on and your body just says, yeah, it's sleep time. This is what we do when we sleep. And so I, when I put that sleep mask on, I, I'm asleep within minutes. It's normally half an hour, an hour before I can get to sleep. Very difficult. It's, uh, it's really annoying, uh, or at least it was because I don't have that anymore. So, um, I would try all those. The, I have heard people say that they can't sleep without carbs. You know, Sally Norton is one of these things, you know, you, I, so you could, it, I would try these things first because I, I would, I would bet that it will, it will sort it out. It sorts it out for most people. Um, you know, even adding in a bit of melatonin, I, I, that can help a lot and that can help reset things and get you going. And then you don't need the melatonin after that. But if you find that you do all these things and exhaust all these different avenues, you know, have a glass of whole milk raw, preferably, um, before you go to bed. If I have a glass of milk, like uh, even raw milk, um, you know, I avoid it because of the sugars and the carbs, but, uh, every now once a year or so when I, when I, get my hands on some raw milk or something like that. I might have some. And man, I'm within an hour. I am just like nodding off on the couch in the middle of the day. Right. And so that's, uh, that could be that where you're, you're sort of suppressed your ketone levels, your blood sugar goes up, but then it comes down and now your ketones are down, your insulin is up. So you're not making any, and you're not making any blood sugar either. And now your blood sugar is a little low and you're just, Ugh, and your brain just gets a little tired. I mean, you know, starving your brain for energy to make you go to sleep, maybe not the best idea, but you know, if that's, if that's the only thing that gets you down, then fine. I mean, that used to be an old, um, treatment for sleep was a warm, warm glass of milk would help people go to sleep. Maybe that's why I'm not sure, but I certainly noticed a similar sort of result. Um, so give those other things a try first and then maybe add the raw milk as well. Whole milk, you need the fat and you want it raw and non-homogenized if you can. Uh, Alicia, thank you for the super chat. I think there's, um, yeah, you posted your question down here. How can I get enough fat? Um, bilio, pain, I'm going to say pancreatic diversion with duodenal switch, um, 75 centimeters of common channel. Estimated, I only absorb 20% of the fats I consume. Creon, prescription enzymes, question mark, have severe IBS, IBD already. Uh, look, if you, if you have pancreatic in insufficiency due to this, um, you know, this issue, it looks like you have a diversion. So surgical, I'm, I'm guessing, um, then yeah, you might have, uh, digestion issues. The, the bile is what's going to help you absorb it. But if it's not breaking down enough because you're not having the digestive enzymes coming from your, your pancreas, then um, yeah, you may need to take that. And so talk to your doctor about that, see if you do. Um, and then if you get enough just from taking Creon, uh, which is these digestive enzymes um, that for people with pancreatic insufficiency, if people don't know that, um, and that helps and that's great. If you're still not absorbing enough and it might be a bile issue, you could take some uh, ox bile, but the idea that your body wouldn't be making enough is probably pretty low um, because your liver just makes this stuff automatically. And if it's not getting down into your um, into your small intestine, it's backing up into the liver and you're getting jaundiced, right? So that's, uh, that's unlikely. I, I don't think you'll need to take ox bile. I think that um, if your pancreatic's not, pancre uh, pancreas isn't working, you have pancreatic insufficiency then taking cre Creon uh, prescription enzymes is probably a good idea. So talk to your doctor about that and see if that's uh, something you need. Okay. So Copperhead Jones, thank you for the super chat. Um, doctor wants to do an ankle fusion due to osteoarthritis. I don't want to do it. Do I have hope that I can walk pain-free someday going carnivore? Um, probably not pain-free, but very, very potentially uh, reduced pain. Um, fusions aren't fun on the ankle. 
obviously, you know, you're going to be walking very stiffly for the rest of your life. So I, I definitely understand the, the desire not to do that. If you strengthen the joint, if you strengthen the muscles around the ankle, doing calf raises, things like that, toe raises, even with a bit of, of weight attached to the, your toes, that'll strengthen up the ankle joint. That'll stabilize it. That'll make it hurt less as well. Carnivore diet will reduce your inflammation. It's not going to regrow your cartilage, though. It's just going to reduce the pain that you experience. Is that going to eliminate all pain? Likely not but it can reduce it significantly to the point that other people have said, hey, I don't need a joint replacement anymore. You know, look at my interview with Dr. Gary Fetke, F-E-T-T-K-E. He's an orthopedic surgeon here in Australia, and he would put people on keto carnivore diets who needed joint replacement surgeries, and he would say, hey, okay, I'll put you on for a joint replacement. Here's your date in three months, but until that, you need to be on this diet, this keto carnivore diet. And he said the ones that were able to stick with it after about two months, he would often get a call from them and, and they would say, hey, doc, I don't think I need surgery anymore. My shoulder feels great. My knee feels great. And so he said, oh, okay, no problem. We'll, we'll cancel the list. That's, that's not a problem. Let me know if you need anything. And um, Dr. Baker found that too. You know, that's what he got in trouble for originally as an orthopedic surgeon because he was telling people about these dietary methods and they didn't need surgery anymore. And it pissed off his hospital because he's not bringing in the millions anymore, right? Because these are expensive ass surgeries, you know? Um, and so the hospital makes a lot of money on them. That's not what we're here for. We're not here as doctors to make profits for a company and an organization. We're here to help people. And if the, if the best way to help them is changing their diet, not doing a surgery, then that's what you do. Um, you're immoral and unethical if you do anything else. Um, if you do the more costly procedure that causes more harm to the patient, you're a bad doctor, you're a bad person, and you should lose your license. You should not be allowed to practice medicine on people. So the right thing to do is to do the right treatment, the correct treatment, the best treatment, the one that's going to do less harm or no harm, and it's going to give them the, be the best outcome possible. And uh, diet really is the first, first step there. You may need a, a fusion. People do ankle replacements now. Or, um, so arthroplasties where they, they replace the joint in the ankle like they can in their shoulder, like they can in the knees. Um, so you don't necessarily need a fusion anyway. It could be that you, depending on what's going on, it could be that you uh, can get a, uh, a, tra um, a joint replacement, but you know, not everybody does these. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a much, uh, well, it's not, it's, it's not a very common surgery. So, um, you know, uh, that's an option too, but I would definitely try it. I mean, good Lord, why wouldn't you, you know, try it for three months. See how you go. Get a lot of fat, a lot of meat. Stop eating when it stops tasting good. Cut out everything else, even coffee and tea, they will increase inflammation that will increase pain in your ankle. It will. Pr trust me on that. It will. And so just high fat meat, just water, that's it. You will reduce your pain. You will. Is it going to be enough that you say, okay, I can live like this or I can function normally like this, especially with the exercises? Great. You know, that's the question that you need to, that you need to answer. And if it can, then great. And if it can't, and it's just still too much, even though it's improved, you know, you always have surgery. It's you're not going to die if you if you don't get surgery right now, right? This isn't a life or limb threatening emergency. It's just pain. It's uncomfortable. So you have time. You know, you have time to do this, and you can see that um, you know what it does and how it how it affects you, and uh, strengthen the muscles, strengthen the ankle joint, and change your diet, and uh, you will get improvements hopefully enough that you don't need surgery. And if you do need surgery, look into ankle replacements as opposed to fusions. Petra Schumann, thank you for the super chat. Two months in, I still have daily diarrhea. This is a diarrhea day today. I, I will not stop. Uh, eat 70-30 fat to protein by calories, I'm assuming. Yeah, I take electrolytes, uh, no coffee, have microscopic colitis. What can I try? 
Um, well, the microscope colitis, you know, I mean, you should, you know, be that you're having a bit of inflammation to something um, and irritation. So I would, I would definitely try to um, reduce out anything except for red meat, and um, and that's it. So just red meat and water, and just salt to taste, and uh, and see how you go. Um, and get rid of everything else. Uh, you're taking electrolytes. Do those electrolytes have artificial sweeteners like stevia or erythritol, monk fruit sugar? If they do, they cause diarrhea. Get rid of them. Are you taking other electrolytes like magnesium? If you do, stop it. Um, magnesium can cause diarrhea. If you're taking metformin, which is a very typical drug for a lot of people with diabetes to take, that can cause loose stools. Does that mean you stop that? No, you talk to your doctor about that. But it's just to understand that that can cause loose stools as well. So all these things adding on can, can cause problems. Um, you're not drinking coffee, which is great. But what about tea? Tea can cause diarrhea as well. So you want to stop absolutely everything besides fatty meat and water. Um, try to stick to beef as well, lamb, especially if you have uh, signs of inflammation in your, in your colon. Um, and then if you're still getting that and there's nothing else explaining it, you know, you can try and reduce it a bit more. I think, you know, that, that 70, 30 fat to protein by calories is, is usually pretty good. Usually pe people don't get diarrhea on that unless they're having other things like stevia in their electrolytes or erythritol, monk fruit sugar. So cut out all those things first. If that doesn't quite do the trick, just reduce the fat a bit. See how you go. You should get to a point where things solidify up. And, um, you know, if you get too too blocked up. Again, you can get overflow diarrhea. It's watery stools with dry, hard, craggly rocks that come out every now and then. And obviously that means a lot more fat is what you need. So good luck with that. So Beverly, thank you for the super chat. Hello, Dr. Chafee. Uh, thank you for all you do for everyone. I have hemochromatosis, but do not eat organ meat. Uh, do I need to be concerned on a carnivore diet? No, I don't think so. I have I have patients that um, have stopped needing to give blood um, because of their hemochromatosis. And, and one gentleman doesn't even have genetically hemochromatosis. He just had the phenotype for it. He just his iron was going up, 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 up. And so every two months he needed to give give blood. And um, at least they, um, and these are just isolated cases, but um, they have. Um, not needed to give blood since then, and the body just perfectly regulates her blood uh, iron levels. So this is the thing: is it's about it's about the metabolism, metabolizing your iron properly, as opposed to you're getting too much in. I mean, there's people that that eat meat and and have low iron levels, you know. So what's going on there? Or they have normal. So it's not it's not about how much you're bringing in; it's about how your body's utilizing it, and how your body is is processing meat or, or processing the iron. So. That's the problem with hemochromatosis is you're not metabolizing it properly or other people that have different sort of metabolism, metabolite issues with hemochromatosis or that don't have hemochromatosis, but have the same effects of hemochromatosis, which is uh, high iron levels. So see how it goes. It's certainly not going to hurt you. Um, I think that in, it can potentially improve how your body metabolizes iron. Dr. Baker has a lot more patients that in, in his database with Rivero. Um, this is just my practice, but I'm seeing. So I've, I've a smaller patient uh, database to, to draw from. But uh, Dr. Baker has well over 10,000 uh, people in Rivero. I think it's been 12,000 for a long time. They've opened it up to more people now. So who knows where they're at now? Um, and uh, he said that they've had a number of patients with hemochromatosis actually improve their iron levels. So, you know, if, uh, if you still need to get blood draws every couple months, you know, it's no skin off your back. You're still, you're, you're doing the same thing. Uh, but it could very well, could very well help. And it's not going to hurt you anyway. It's not, it's not something that's going to limit you. If you have a bit of organ meat every now and then, I, I don't think that's a big deal either. Um, just do that to taste, you know, has very good nutrients in it. B12, B6, uh, folate, um, is a very important vitamin that, um, uh, sometimes people are lacking if they're only eating muscle meat. So it's something to think about there too. So, you know, having a bit of organs every now and then is fine. And um, uh, see how it goes. See how, I mean, obviously keep testing your iron and see what happens there. But um, I think that, well, I'm hopeful that, it, well, that it'll improve things, but I don't think it'll make it worse anyway. I don't think there's anything special you need to do. 
Um, so yeah, good luck with that. Let us know how that goes because you know, um, we, we don't see, or I don't see all that many people with hemochromatosis. And so I talk about, I talk to them and I, and I give this advice to them. Um, and I see some of them come back and improve, but you know, a lot of them go away and don't come back and don't tell me. So I want to know, I want to know, is this actually helping the majority of people or is it just a one-off here and there? So that's the important thing. So see how it goes for you, see how it goes in the next few months. And, um, and if it's good, you know, please do report back and let everyone know how you're doing. Okay, everyone, this looks like the last uh, super chat. Um, some of the ones that, that came in late um, uh, are, are here. So this is the last one of those. So I'll stop it after this, guys. Um, and then yeah, it's been about three and a half hours. So uh, I think that's a pretty good session. Um, okay, question from P. Thank you for the super chat. Um, I've been full carnivore, no salt, eight months, no improvements in my psoriasis. Your thoughts on water fasting for 14 plus days? Um, fasting helps psoriasis. You can certainly try it. Fasting for over 14 days is quite long. You have to worry about refeeding issues. Um, so if you are going to start eating again, you eat a small amount. Just, just start with it, just a small bit. See how your body reacts. Wait a couple hours. If you want to eat again, you eat again. Um, I tried fasting once. I just did four days. Didn't really feel like eating for most of those days anyway. And uh, on the phone, you know, after I finished four days, I sort of thought like, do I even want to eat? I actually don't feel hungry. But, you know, I did that in my early 20s. I wasn't eating four days in time and I, it, it caught up with me. And so that's not what you want to do. So I did eat and I got back to eating normally and that's fine. Um, but uh, I didn't have much of an appetite. I only ate a little bit that first day. My body didn't want too much. You still listen to your body. Just have a little bit if you're going to refeed. You don't even necessarily have to do 14 plus days fasting. I don't know. First of all, I don't know of much benefit from fasting outside of you know, cancer that, um, that you get the, on top of just not eating the wrong things. If you're eating fatty meats and not eating carbs or sugar and you're in that correct metabolic state, uh, that ketogenic metabolic state, then um, then that, that, does, that does most of it. You get the autophagy, you get the mitophagy, you're, you're removing all these things your body's reacting negatively to and so on. But if you want to if you want to fast and, and you want to see if that helps, you know, go for it. Just be careful. Um, if you're doing a longer fast, like longer than five days, you need to just you know slowly reintroduce food and um, and make sure your body's handling that properly. Um, another thing that I've seen with psoriasis, first of all, psoriasis, you know, this the, these sorts of things like psoriasis and autoimmune issues in general, they respond much better to just red meat and water. So if you're having pork, chicken, fish, dairy, eggs, all those things, cut those out, just go red meat and water. And um, that is, people generally do a lot better with that. And um, and then people that I've seen that even do that, but just have really stubborn cases of psoriasis. Um, one gentleman told me that um, after about six months of just lion diet, that he is his psoriasis wasn't shifting, and so he started using uh, tallow, just plain tallow, no scents or or, or anything like that, um, as a moisturizer. And he said, it was "Just gone." Uh, that 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 did it. So I mentioned that to a couple other people that had refractory cases, and it seemed to help them into as well. So try that. Try to get some just flat out tallow or emu oil or something like that with no scents and nothing else, and. Um, um, and so, um, if you do that, um, that can potentially help as well. And, uh, you know, just go red meat and water, use tallow as a, as a moisturizer. It's the best thing for your skin ever anyway. It says I've, I've never had better skin than when I've used that stuff. And, um, and then if you want to fast on top of that, you can try, uh, but just remember about refeeding and, uh, just easing back into things. Don't starve yourself too much. Your body needs food. Um, you can handle periods without eating. All, all predators can. All animals can. We always all have to survive famines at one point or another, or else our species wouldn't exist anymore. Um, so we're capable of doing that, but um, I don't think it's necessary. And uh, unless you have a cancer and you're specifically trying to drop your blood sugar and get your ketones up as high as possible. So see how you go. Hopefully that, that clears up. And um, hopefully those just red meat and water and the tallow sorts it out. 
If not, and you want to try fasting, you know, go for it. Hopefully it helps. Okay. All right. Thank you all very much. I really appreciate that. I'm going to um, do a, uh, you know, the weekly new video as, as always on Monday morning, uh, Australia time, Sunday afternoon, evening in America. And um, that'll be sort of same time as always, uh, or thereabouts. And um, so hopefully people can join that for the premiere and, and chat live and we do text chat while we watch the episode, which I, I always really like, and hopefully other people enjoy it too. And it also really helps get the word out there and get and make um, YouTube understand that this is something that's that's popular and interesting to people and they suggest it to more people. And so um, thank you very much for um, for joining me today. Hopefully you guys can join me for the, the premiere on Sunday, Monday. Um, and then I'll have other things out during the week. I, I've been trying to try to put like shorter clips. You know, obviously these are <laughs> hours long, so not everybody can sit through that. So I try to make like sort of 10, 15 minute chunks of things and release those in just little segments and the shorts and things like that. So hopefully people like those. Maybe tell me in the comments, let me know, is that is that something useful to you guys cutting these things up into shorter, shorter uh, bites and um, uh, shorter pieces of content? Is that helpful? Or is it just sort of, um, or is it just sort of too much? Just let me know down in the comments if you can. And uh, thank you all very much. And we'll see you next week. I'll try to do uh, another. I'm going to start doing two of these a week uh, on the weeks that I can. Um, yeah. So I'll probably do this next Wednesday morning, my time, Tuesday afternoon, evening in America. So we'll see how that goes. And, um, and if that's a good time for people, we'll do that Monday, Friday, or in America, Tuesday, Thursday. And we'll see how we go. And then premieres on Sunday, Monday. All right, everyone, thank you very much. Please do like and share or su uh, subscribe if you haven't and you want to see more sort of content like this and get updates on my, my videos as they come out. Please do leave a comment about what you thought and maybe your experiences with things that we talked about today, like hemochromatosis, stubborn diarrhea, and uh, all the other things that we talked about. Other people are going to have these same problems too, and that can really help them going through the comments and, uh, and reading about that. So, all right. Thank you all very much, and I'll see you next time.